to uh, at this time we'd like to uh, open public comment for items that are not to be a part of this evening's agenda. And so uh, general comments is uh, uh, are being considered at this time. Are there any comments? Do you see any, Susan? Susan, I think you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Okay, uh, I think I need to tell people how to raise their hands so they can do so if they're interested in making public comment. So before you do that, I'd like to also say uh, for for people who are uh, calling in or looking in that uh, you should be able to see tonight's meeting agenda on your screen. If you can't see the screen and have joined by phone only, I'll be announcing the agenda items as we move through the meeting topics. Due to COVID-19, regular meetings and public hearings of the Clark County Historic Preservation Commission will be held in a virtual meeting room. This will allow for safe participation by commission members, staff, and any citizen interested in attending. Members of the public and applicants have joined as an attendee, which means you can see and hear the event if you join by computer or mobile device, or you can just hear the event if you join by phone. Other than event participants, uh, other event participants cannot see video or hear your audio unless you are acknowledged by the commission chair or staff and are unmuted. Um, in addition to uh, roll call and introductions, uh, we'll have uh, approval of the meeting minutes from uh, November. Um, public comment for subjects other than the public hearings on the meeting's agenda, as there will be specific public comment periods as part of the hearing. There'll be a public hearing for a certificate of appropriateness for the old city cemetery fence replacement and an advisory review with the Vancouver Heritage Overlay for the Aegis Mixed Use Development Phase Two Committee. We may have old business and updates. We'll have good of the order and then adjournment. And so uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, approving the draft of November 3rd meeting notes. So if uh, there are uh, no additions, deletions, or amendments, I would accept a an, a, an approval, a, a motion to approve these uh, notes. So moved. So Greg has moved that we accept them. Is there a second? Second that. This is Paige. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that the November 3rd meeting notes be approved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Looks like it's passed unanimously. So now, Susan, if you'd please uh, instruct how public comment may be made. We'll take public comment on any items besides tonight's public hearing items. Please keep remarks brief and to the point. You'll have three minutes to speak. Susan will provide instructions on how to make public comment for those joining us through their computer or mobile device or for those joining by audio only. Thanks, Susan. Okay, uh, I also want to let you know that I think I think Jan Bader just joined us. Good evening, Jan. Good evening. Sorry, technical difficulties. Understood. <laughs> Understood. Great, thank you. Okay, for attendees using their computer or WebEx application, if you would like to speak, please utilize the raised hand icon. You can do this by clicking the participant button or icon, the location of which depends on the device you're using. Staff will only acknowledge those attendees during the public comment period who have raised their hand by selecting the hand icon. When you're acknowledged, you will be unmuted. And when you've finished your comment, please click the hand icon again to lower your hand. For attendees using the telephone, an audio only option, you need to press star three on your phone's 
uh, number panel to raise your hand. When you are acknowledged, you will be unmuted. When you've finished your comment, please press star three to lower your hand. And please note public comment is limited to three minutes per person in order to accommodate all speakers. Okay, and I am not seeing any raised hands. Susan, Holly's yeah. there. You have to look under the um, right side oh. panel. You'll see the hand. If they changed it on WebEx, it only shows up there, not on the box. Okay. So, Holly, you are unmuted. Thank you, Susan. Yay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Holly Chamberlain from the Historic Trust with our monthly report. We're pleased to note that the organization has a new CEO president, Michelle Reeves, formerly of Civilist Consulting. You will learn more about this highly qualified community revitalization and placemaking specialist over time, and she is presenting this evening. Welcome, Michelle. In regard to Providence Academy, the trust and our consultants, Sarah and Olson Engineering, have had a pre-app meeting with the city staff in regard to rehabilitation of the Academy's south landscaping and renovations to the southeast parking lot. More renovation, more information will be forthcoming after plans are adapted based on city staff comments. Steel supports have been installed for the West Porch reconstruction, but other work has been delayed due to the continuing supply chain issues and some challenging weather. However, any local groundhogs were not frightened by their shadows this morning, so we can expect spring <laughs> soon. In regard to mitigation for the removal of the laundry and boiler buildings and potential removal of the smokestack, items that need to be submitted to the city prior to the issuance of the permit are being compiled. The archaeological monitoring permit has been issued by DAP. At Officers Row in the West Barracks, we continue to negotiate with a potential restaurateur to operate in the Grant House, and we're continuing with the prep work in that building that will be necessary no matter who moves in. Unfortunately, security issues have become increasingly challenging. Cameras have been installed near the Officers Row bank of mailboxes to hopefully improve security. The land bridge remains closed during installation of new pavers, but good progress has been made by the city's contractor. While no completion date is set due to inclement weather slowing construction, the project may be done in February. More information is available on the city's website. Fifth Street is receiving some improvements courtesy of a federal lands access project grant received by the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. That work will extend into the fall. The trust is keeping its tenants and people with event rentals informed as to how to best enter the area during construction detours. Uh, nominations are now open for the Marshall Leadership Awards presented annually to promising young adult and youth leaders in Clark County. For more information, go to the trust website to access the nomination form. Farther afield, the draft management plan for the new Washington Maritime National Heritage, Heritage Area is available for comment. You can find it at the website of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation at preservewa.org backslash ahoy. Heritage Caucus continues to meet virtually during this short legislative session every Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. In addition to a discussion of pending bills, agencies and organizations report on their activities. For example, Brad Richardson presented this morning on behalf of the Washington Museum Association. Heritage Caucus is the most effective way of staying abreast of proposed legislation directly relevant to the heritage community. The Washington State Historical Society coordinates the presentations and agendas. To sign up to receive the agendas and Zoom links, check the Historical Society's website. Thank you very much. Thanks, Holly. That was great. Susan, are there any other uh, people who would like to make a comment? I do not see any other raised hands. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move to the we'll move to public hearing, the certificate of appropriateness application for the old city cemetery fence replacement located at 2700 East Mill Plain Boulevard in Vancouver. I will open this online public hearing for a certificate of appropriateness. 
The steps involved in the hearing are shown on the slide. Do any commission members have any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest? Hearing none, the City of Vancouver staff will now give a summary of the staff report and recommendations. Great. And here's Thank Mark you. Person. Thank you, Chair sure. Greg. Susan, would you allow me to share my presentation here? Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. So we've received a certificate of appropriateness to replace the south fence on the Vancouver City Cemetery. I have an aerial photograph here. Can everyone see my presentation? Just want to make sure. Okay, good. Uh, located just off of Mill Plain, 2700 Mill Plain, just west of Grand Boulevard. Uh, if you recall, uh, I think some of the commissioners uh, were, were involved in uh, putting this on the local registry. This was uh, in 2020, so just a, a couple of years back. As you can see, as part of your packet and on the uh, presentation here, there's some uh, definitely some wear and 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 damage from automobiles that uh, jumped the curb and and the sidewalk there, which is a little bit scary uh, in in a number of locations. West Gate and Central Gate uh, along the south side are also shown here as well. Let me go back to my staff report here. So uh, under City of Vancouver Ordinance, uh, Clark County HPC has a responsibility for reviewing matters of historic preservation with this in, within the City of Vancouver. Per our code, uh, no person shall construct any new building or structure or reconstruct, alter, restore, remodel, repair, move, demolish, or make any material change affecting significant historic features as, list, as listed in the designation application to any existing property on the Clark County Heritage Register or within the historic district without review by the commission and without a receipt of a certificate of appropriateness. So uh, the gate, I, I did include the full nomination in the information to the commission and, and the gate, the gates and the fence are, are definitely listed as as part of, of what makes this uh, site historic. Uh, and, and I did copy just a little bit of the physical description in the staff report for your reference, but we have a number of historically prominent figures uh, such as Lowell Hidden, Charles and Laura Slocum and Esther Short uh, laid to rest in this site, as well as a number of heritage trees uh, that, are, that are located on this site here. Uh, back to my presentation. I uh, have a clip of the replacement fence here. And we do have someone from our public works uh, department, uh, Eric Bjerke, uh, to answer any questions the commission might have as far as the replacement and, and the work to be done. Uh, the, re the design review criteria are listed in our rules and regulations. They're the standards used in the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Now, the standards and findings uh, are listed here and in the staff reports. So staff reviewed those and found um, uh, that staff is recommending that the HPC approve the certificate of appropriateness based on the application materials and staff report that are dated January 19, 2022. Go back to some photos here. And that's the end of, of my presentation. I'm here for any process questions, chair and commission members. Oh, no. Do any commission members have Sorry. Uh, questions for Mark Pearson? I'll ask a question. This may be better for the applicant, but I'll ask Mark. So I noticed between the narrative that was submitted 
and the application. The application was very short, just had one line saying South Fence will be replaced. But in the narrative, there's no mention of the whole fence being replaced. It simply talks about the gates and a panel on the, um, I have it right here, and a panel on the east side. But in the picture, you also show a panel that exhibit six it says it's the west end as well. So the narrative, I have a lot of questions about the narrative, but I was just curious if you also had the opportunity to maybe delve a little bit more into that in your review in terms of what the narrative says versus just that one line in the application. And if it's better for the applicant, I have a variety of questions along those lines, so I'm happy to wait to ask that. I just wanted to see if you read something that I may have missed. I, I think that's a good clarification. I mean, let's hear from, from the applicant, but it's definitely my impression that the complete fence line and the, and the gates will either be refurbished or replaced depending on, on their condition. I, I can jump in here if you can hear me. Um, my camera seems to be acting up. I, I can try to restart my video here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I'll turn that off. But um, a total of 620 feet of of the front fence front fence line will be replaced, and it's a uh, it's bent and uh, it's been run into. Uh, so the entire fence really needs to be replaced. Now the gates, on the other hand, are actually in fair shape, and so we're going to uh, keep all of the original gates, the west, the center, and the east gate. Um, there's a panel on the east side that was ran into and completely down on the ground and, and really messed up. So, um, so the entire fence will be the, the two rail uh, picket fence, like what you see there. And, uh, and then with the, with the uh, gates, um, we're going to have them removed and repaired in kind and then repowder coated so it matches the new fence. So it'll all be uh, um, black when it's all done, just like the original fence was. I have other questions, but I should I wait until we no. move on to him as applicant? I think we I think we've effectively jumped to uh, questions for applicant, which is which is fine, because that is the next uh, the next order of business. So go ahead, Julie, and continue with your questions, please. Okay. All right. Great. And do you say your name, Willen? William Bjerke. William. Okay. Or, or Bill. Yeah. So, okay, whichever you prefer. <laughs> so okay, that helps. But let me. So I just want to clarify because. I, Looking at the narrative, I had some questions in relation to the photos and the brochure. So I'm I'm looking down because I have my notes next to me. Okay. So I apologize for not making eye contact all the time. But based on um sorry, let me go to notes. Just a second. Okay, so just to just to make sure I'm clear, nothing's happening on the north side of the fence, right? No. Okay. Um and then in terms of um, what I read in the narrative, all the gates will stay, the original gates will stay, however, they're going to be removed, cleaned, um, repaired where needed, and then re, what do they call it? Um, basically reglazed, repowdered. Powder coated. And, and, uh -huh. and those those wrought iron, those original wrought irons are going to be put back. That's correct. Okay. So, and so that's for the east, west, and I'm going to call it the south, but it's the central, right? That main gate right there that we see. In the Correct. Of the night. Okay. And then, um, per the narrative, and I think this is maybe just, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Um, on the west side, it said no fence would be replaced, and yet exhibit six shows that there's a piece that has been damaged. So is that actually going to be replaced, that fence line, or is that exhibit not west? Is that actually on the south side looking east? That's on the south side looking east from the west side. Yep, from the basically from the gate looking east. Oh, okay. You're standing on the west side looking down the south gate to the east. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's correct. Yep. Okay. Stand on the sidewalk there on no plan. And that's what uh -huh. I visioned, but it said west end. So I, I was thinking it meant the west gate. And I'm like, that doesn't quite sound right. Okay. Um, so that whole fence line will be the entire thing, that six hundred and twenty feet, what have you, square feet. Yes, will be replaced. And so my question there was about the montage majestic. So the montage majestic. So this is a very plain looking fence on this south side. It's just a very simple looking fence. Um, and so the, the montage majestic. 
it looks similar except there's that extra line there as that extra um no the but the, the fence rendering showed only one so it sounds like you guys designed it to match is that right yeah it only has the two rails the top and the bottom there's no third rail there yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, because I did look at the rendering and it did show that took account for it. Okay, great. And then um, in terms of the central gate, not the fence, there's no um, in the central gate. Let's see. Pardon me while I look at my notes here. Um, so on the, okay, so that's the south fence and the south gate. And the gate will also have, it looks like there's a panel that needs to be repaired and replaced. Is that correct? Yeah, it looks like a part of the rest of the fence. And so, yeah, the entire fence is along this, that whole south side of the cemetery. And so, so the gate, it, oh, I'm sorry. And then, the, the, yeah, the, the central gate is what's what's on the photo there. And uh, that that will be, um, I think it has a, a hinge that needs to be repaired and then, right. and then it can be powder coated and put back in place. And yeah. we might we might actually, um, uh, you know, clean up those uh, the two concrete pillars there just to freshen them up a little bit. Okay, but in terms of the the ornate um, topping, I, for some reason I'm losing my vocabulary. I apologize. Um, I, it's the trident at the top of the gates because the gates mm -hmm. have actually quite ornate wrought mm -hmm. iron, mm -hmm. and so those will remain intact. My my one uncertainty was so if only it's only the south gate that's being replaced in kind, essentially by the design that you've selected then the other sides the west and the east side the, the fences are not being replaced they're simply being repaired correct okay and so those ornate pieces on the gates same thing as that central gate yes not replacement okay well, thank you sorry to take time to do that but i just wanted to make sure i was understanding time. The, the two um yeah. then my other question is and is well maybe not a question more of a statement so the Secretary of Interior does have certain guidance to help with how to clean wrought iron and how to paint and resurface um, historic iron. And this being from 1912, 1914, in the, in the early 19th, um, early 20th century, it may be worthwhile to um, ensure that those that, that is looked at in terms of the restoration part and the restoration work. So that no further damage is done in that in that cleaning and re um i say reglazing that's not what it's called powder coating yeah they have a term though and i keep keep losing that term but um mm. so i just wanted to mention that because the there is specific guidance for wrought iron and since this is a wrought iron gate i think it would be very um, relevant for that to be looked at assessed and um, to ensure that nothing further you know nothing further is damaged obviously that your plan is to preserve it but just wanted to mention that oh thank you that's a great suggestion we'll do that we'll look into it thank you for all that clarification i appreciate it I'll sure turn the mic over to anybody else any further questions um go ahead Hearing none, we will now open the public comment period related specific, specifically to the Certificate of Appropriateness application. Please note that if you wish to retain the ability to be a party of record on this matter or to challenge or defend any decision made on this matter, please state and spell your name and provide your mailing address or email for the record. Staff will now provide instructions on how to make public comment for those joining us through their computer or mobile device, and for those joining by telephone audio only. Susan? Thank you, Andy. Let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, for attendees using their computer or WebEx application, if you'd like to speak, please raise your virtual hand following the directions on the screen. For attendees using the telephone, you need to press star three on your phone's panel to raise your hand. Staff will acknowledge those who have raised their hand and unmute you one at a time. When you've finished your comment, please lower your hand. On a computer, you can do this by clicking on the hand icon again, and on the phone, you can press star three. 
Please note public comment is limited to three minutes per person in order to accommodate all speakers. And I'm I am not seeing any raised hands. All right. Thank you, Susan. The public hearing is now closed. The commission will now deliberate. The commission must make findings that either agree with the staff's findings on each criterion or make specific comments on any finding. After the deliberation, we'll ask for a motion and at this time, I'd like to uh, initiate uh, deliberation among commissioners. Are there any comments or questions? I think Julie answered a lot of the questions I had and just it was nice to hear the elaboration on that as well from uh, the guest. And so thank you for that. And I also wanted to say that that packet that was uh, included along with that with the history was really great. I like I'm not from around here and I'm fairly new to the area. So I really love being a part of this committee because I can learn about the history of the city that I'm living in now. So I do um, just want to say I appreciate that uh, as included with the uh, application. Very nice. Would someone please make a motion to uh, approve the certificate of appropriateness? I'll move to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the Old City Cemetery. Is that, is that Julie? Yes. Okay. Second it. It's been moved. Chan. Okay, thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded that the certificate of appropriateness for this application for the Vancouver City Cemetery be approved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Susan, since uh, it appears to be a, unan a unanimous um, voice vote, is a roll call uh, still necessary? Uh, I'm not sure, so I'm going to suggest that we do the roll call. Okay, so okay. Uh, please please pull the commission and we'll respond. Okay, Paige Alfuth. Aye. Jan Bader. Aye. Julie Bond. Aye. Morgan Frazier. Aye. Greg Foos. Aye. Andy Gregg. Aye. Andy, uh, I didn't have, oh, sorry. Six yes votes. Sorry, Julie. It's okay. I can't um, how to raise my hand, so I don't know how to jump in. We used to have, I just wanted to note for the applicant, just so they don't have to go searching for it. Um, the, the standard that you'll be looking for is the brief 27, and that's about wrought iron and how to protect and preserve and restore and replace. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that footnote and the motion has passed. And now we'll move on to an advisory review. The Vancouver Heritage Overlay Review for the Aegis Mixed Use Development Phase 2 Providence Academy site at 312 East Evergreen Boulevard in Vancouver, Washington. City of Vancouver staff will now make a presentation. Keith Jones, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, members of the commission. I'm Keith Jones. I'm a senior planner with the city of Vancouver. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my presentation. Let's see. Can uh, you see my screen? Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, again, I'm Keith Jones. Uh, just a, a small agenda for tonight's meeting. As the chair had indicated, this is a advisory review, so it's not necessarily a public hearing. 
Um, but for tonight's meeting, I'll go ahead and give an introduction to the project. The applicant will then present, that's Aaron Wagat with Marathon Development. Uh, I believe if there's anybody here tonight that would like to provide testimony, we'll, uh, the chair will allow that to occur. And then we can take any questions. Um, staff would just, city staff would just request uh, that that the commission make a motion tonight uh, and a recommendation to city staff. And then following uh, tonight's meeting, probably likely by the end of the month, staff will render a land use decision on the application. So just to let you know what the land use application process is. So uh, staff, this is a type two site plan review and SEPA. And so back in December, staff did notice the application to the public, including posting the site, mailing within 500 feet of the site, uh, allowing for a 14 day comment period under the city's code and uh, issued a mitigated determination of non-significance uh, for the SEPA review. And we did not receive any uh, public comments within that time frame. Uh, the only public comments I'm aware of that were received were a couple of comments uh, in favor of the application. I believe those have been provided to the, the commission at this at this time. So again, uh, following any this the commission's recommendation tonight, staff will then render a decision likely towards the end of, end of the month. So this is uh, it's a little bit of an outdated photo, but just gives some context of the site. So you can see where the main academy building is, the red building. Uh, just uh, some general uh, context. Uh, to the south is the Vancouver Library. To the north is uh, some garden apartments. I think they're from the probably the 1940s. Uh, hotel, uh, restaurants to the north. Of course, I-5 is to the east, as well as uh, beyond that, the, the Fort of Vancouver. You can see Officers Row in the picture. And then um, west of the site are some one level, uh, mainly one level office buildings and also some uh, apartment uh, buildings and an office uh, complex. So the zoning of the property, the, the site is the blue, indicated in the blue box. And just the surrounding zoning in in that bright red, that's uh, city center zoning or CX. So that's a high intensity uh, downtown mixed use uh, uh, zoning. It stretches uh, up kind of north uh, past Mill Plain. Um, and then it, it stretches down south towards and includes the uh, city waterfront. And so that really includes the city of Vancouver's downtown core. And then, uh, of course, the freeway is the dividing line there to the east. And then where the fort's located, as well as the college, that's zone CPX, which is uh, central uh, park zoning. So it's a special zoning for the fort and uh, what they call central park and includes the uh, community college and the high school and so forth and the open spaces that are there. So this is the develop ultimate development plan or site plan for the for the academy site um, so on the left hand side on c street there's two buildings in darker gray building a and b as well as a surface part a linear surface parking area that it extends from evergreen to 12th that's the aegis phase one project and so that that was approved back in 2018, and that went before the commission at that time for an advisory review. And those two buildings are currently under construction as well as the surface parking area. And that included 147 uh, multifamily dwelling units and about 5,000 square feet of commercial space. Most of that commercial space is on the ground floor of building A, and that faces a plaza that's um, that's being constructed at the corner there, C and Evergreen. So this project is the phase two Aegis. And so then we're starting to letter those buildings. You can see the hashing up in the northeast corner of the project. So building C, D, and E, as well as a parking structure. So that's all it's, and it's, it's uh, shown as different buildings, but it's really one, uh, one structure, essentially it's attached together. Um, and then between the main academy building and phase two is some 
open space that the applicant proposes to uh, provide. And then um, I believe Holly Chamberlain mentioned this, but the historic trust on its own, this is a separate project. You can see in the south east quadrant is a proposed parking area. And then also with that, the, the trust is also proposing to upgrade the landscaping at the front of the academy building where the heart shape um, turnaround is. So that's a separate project, but this is really kind of showing you what the ultimate build out is. And then uh, I just have some statistics there in, in that I've bolted out for the project. So it's six stories, 200 apartment units, this, the parking structures, 201 parking spaces, sort of surrounding that is 34 surface parking spaces. And then the open space proposed is around 42,000 square feet. So I just, what I did here is I just windowed in on phase two and highlight the boundary of the scope of this project. So that's what we're reviewing tonight uh, in the yellow highlight. Uh, so the, the main building, the surface parking area, the open space, and then um, again, to the left, there is the uh, surface parking from phase one, but then sort of extends to the north end of the main academy building. And then the box kind of down there in the lower right corner, that's the gym, gymnasium um, and preschool. That's a uh, former gymnasium, I believe it's used as a preschool uh, currently. Um, so this is uh, just identifying <clears throat> the open space area more clearly. So just a, just a few things here, uh, staff, when we issue the mitigated determination of non-significance, we required a, a few mitigation measures. So one of those mitigation measures is that that open space be dedicated to the public. And so uh, the applicant and the historic trust are working on um, getting a document to the city that would make that available within reasonable hours of operation uh, for the public to be able to access that open space. And, and enjoy that area and, and, and be uh, on the campus and around the academy structure. And I know that the applicant will get to their presentation, but we'll talk more about the programming for that open space and, and what, they, uh, what they envision for that public uh, area. Um, one of the main requirements in the city's code, so the heritage overlay is uh, a section of the city's code. This is, uh, Area one of that overlay has specific uh, standards for development of the academy site. Um, one of those, and, and one of the, the specific standard is that there's a zero foot height or a view corridor from 12th Street to the north into the academy site. So it, the way it reads, it says uh, one or two areas that total 50 feet in width. Uh, that space between building B and C is 93 feet and staff is conditioned that the applicant provide that full 93 feet. The other uh, requirement of the SEPA is that uh, there is a um, pedestrian pathway, a wide pedestrian pathway located here that will allow the public to come into the open space. Uh, that's 23 foot wide, so staff is uh, mitigate or required that as a mitigation measure that that will uh, be no uh, less than 23 uh, feet in width. So those are really the three main mitigation measures that uh, we have requested from the applicant so we can uh, get, make sure this is a public open space and available and accessible to the public to uh, uh, congregate and enjoy this uh, area. Um, let's see, so this is just uh, taking some of those main requirements that I discussed um, try to bolt those out for the, the commission. So the, really the first one again is one to two view quarters of, with a zero foot height limit looking south from 12th Street into the academy site with an accumulative, lit, accumulative total of 50 feet. And again, uh, 93 feet is what's being proposed. Um, then um, all new construction shall be similar in material and texture to the main academy building and shall be compro composed primarily of brick with a similar color. So uh, this, this came up on phase one, uh, that those two buildings on phase one are 
primarily composed of brick that was determined to be of similar color. So these buildings uh, will look similar and I'll have the applicant in a moment will kind of go over more of the design uh, details on that, but these will also be composed primarily of, this, of similar brick uh, and look into uh, phase one. And then um, the code then says any, any building uh, in his, and I mentioned this is an historic zone one meets the intents and purposes and requirements of the chapter, which are the heritage overlay. And then um, that recommendation by the commission shall be made to the planning official, which is, which is in this case would be myself that will uh, render the decision um, uh, tonight. So that's, that's uh, concludes my presentation. If there's any process questions, I'm happy to take those from the commission. If, if not, then uh, the, the applicant is here to uh, go through their uh, presentation. So that concludes what I have uh, so far tonight. Thanks, Keith. You're welcome. Would the applicant like to provide any additional testimony? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Susan, I'm going to try and share my screen. I'm far from an expert um, with this technology. But... Can everybody see this presentation? Okay, so uh, my name is Aaron Weigod. I run the development department at Marathon Acquisition and Development. Um, we're the applicant for phase two. We also are the developer and applicant for phase one, which is under construction, which Keith had mentioned. Um, my presentation is fairly lengthy because there's a lot to look at. Uh, I'm gonna give an overview of the project, um, then talk about this public open space, the public artwork, including, and then just generally the design of the structures. So if the technology permits, I welcome um, comments and questions during the presentation. Um, uh, so feel free to interrupt if that's feasible with this technology. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So um, two principles um, that the Historic Trust created um, when they purchased the site have kind of guided our, our design of this project, um, beginning with uh, Providence Academy vision. Providence Academy building is preserved and enhanced as a place of commerce and year-round center of activity for the community. And then the redevelopment objective for the site is to make preservation of the academy economically viable by creating a mixed-use urban campus where modern-day uses merge with history. Um, and I'm going to move on here to, this is a sources and uses that um, is a high level overview of the economics of preserving the academy. Michelle Reeves from the Historic Trust is going to speak in a moment and, and explain this in a little bit more detail. But this um, lays out essentially why the trust had to sell the property that surrounds the academy to produce proceeds um, for the rehabilitation of the main academy building. Um, essentially, we have purchased, or in the end, we'll purchase about $7.5 million worth of land on the site. And that $7.5 million is going directly into um, the academy site. We are also taking on quite a bit of the overall site work on the site, which takes another economic burden off the historic trust in renovating the site. Um, so that's just um, a quick overview of why this was done. I know it's been discussed quite a bit. You've probably heard of it, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands why the trust is doing what they're doing on the site. Um, and to add to that, I kind of just discussed this first paragraph. Um, but to add to it why Marathon is involved in the project, uh, we opted to develop the Providence Academy site over other viable development sites um, because, the, again, the proceeds of the land sale will go directly back into um, a nonprofit restoration of the Academy building. So it would benefit the community rather than just um, buying any other site downtown. We looked at other sites. We looked at sites of the waterfront. Um, this site has been a challenge to develop, um, and it's a sensitive site. We've been tried to honor that, um, but we chose this site because the money that we're putting into the site would go back into what we consider to be um, a good community effort. So in these uh, pictures, you'll see some of the work that's done 
um, that has been done thus far at the academy. Um, the porches and the facade restoration. Uh, if, you, if anybody remembers the El Presidente building, which was out in front of the academy building, has been removed, um, opening up the views of the, the, the front facade of the academy. Um, roof replacement to the academy, which was a, quite an, an endeavor. Um, and then what is underway now, and hopefully will come to fruition soon, is um, restoration of the landscaping in the front of the academy and um, reconfiguration of the parking lot on the southeast corner of the site. So this is the site as a whole. I'll try not to be repetitive of Keith and, and go quick on this, but you'll see here the two buildings on C Street is, is Aegis Phase 1 highlighted in blue. Um, along the north side highlighted in green is Phase 2, which is the subject of the application today. Um, it has roughly an acre of green space between um, the Academy building and um, our Phase 2 buildings, which I'll speak about more in a moment. And then you see in red there what's the remainder of the Providence Academy site and the existing building, um, the landscape, landscaping to be restored out front, and then what will be the new Southeast parking lot. Um, again, some of the vision uh, coming to fruition is Providence Academy. Oh, let me, excuse me, I need to move some of this so I can read everything. Uh, Providence Academy restored landmark and public museum that operates as a self-sustaining office building and event center, and then Aegis, a new mixed-use urban development. This site is truly unique in the sense that it has more uses, um, far more uses than most sites, especially in an, in an urban environment, in that it has a great deal of open space. The Academy building serves as a going concern for office space, event center, public museum, and then the Aegis phases are bringing um, apartment dwellings and um, retail and commercial uses. So it really has an opportunity to be a mixed use urban campus with, with a variety of uses, different times of the day, different periods of the year. So hopefully that will come to fruition, but it's a, it's a unique opportunity and one of the reasons why we chose this site. Um, just some of the development statistics. Again, this will be a little bit repetitive of what Keith said, but uh, phase two is 2.5 acres, 190,000 gross square feet, 200 apartments, uh, parking garage with 201 spaces. Um, the development itself will be quite high end, so it'll have um, you know some of the, the best amenities in town from um, both a site amenity standpoint and um, on the indoor uh, portion of the development. Um, I'm going to go through some of the renderings here just to give you an idea of, of the site and the phase two buildings. Uh, this is a rendering with the south aerial perspective um, from Evergreen Boulevard, and you can see the phase two building back behind the Providence Academy there. This is the same um, perspective except from the pedestrian standpoint, the pedestrian perspective. So this gives you an idea of the, the scale of the building relative to the academy, at least from the Evergreen perspective. Obviously, as you go further north, the buildings feel bigger, but this is, gives you a good idea from the pedestrian perspective on the south side of Evergreen Boulevard. Uh, this is a southwest aerial perspective. Um, this is a, a good rendering of what it would look like from the public library across the street from Providence Academy. You'll see on the left the two buildings. That's Aegis Phase 1, and then you can see a little bit of Aegis Phase 2 behind the academy there. This is the same um, same viewpoint, except from the pedestrian perspective. This is the uh, aerial perspective of what will be this green space or open space we're speaking of between the Academy building and Aegis Phase 2. Uh, this is essentially the view would get from uh, the northernmost building of Aegis Phase 1. And this is, again, the same, same view from the pedestrian perspective. This is the 12th Street perspective from an aerial standpoint. Uh, the building on the right is the northernmost building of Aegis Phase 1. Uh, the building in the middle is uh, the Aegis Phase 2 that we're discussing tonight. And then the parking garage you see tucked back in the corner. Um, and this, again, is 12th Street from the pedestrian standpoint. Um, one revision we've made that I'll just touch on um, since you were provided the package from Keith Jones uh, four to six weeks ago, is we had a retail space planned on the westernmost end of the Aegis 
uh, project. You can see here, if you can see my cursor highlighted in blue. Um, we've decided to eliminate that retail space. Um, we um, were a little concerned about how viable that retail space will be between COVID and it just not having much street frontage. Um, this is also where the uh, enhanced pedestrian corridor into the green space will be. So we moved um, the entrance to the building um, from 12th Street and the green space all to this west end. So that could be the focal point in the entrance to the, the project as a whole. And we think that will will better um, will better enhance that side of the building and uh, make it a little bit more lively, people coming and going, especially from that pedestrian corridor, which I'll show you in a minute. So that was just a change that you weren't, that wasn't included in your package. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware. Um, so the open space, um, Aegis phase two will include 40,000 plus square feet, roughly an acre of open space between the academy building and phase two. Uh, the open space will activate the academy and phase two buildings by providing green space and activity space for Aegis residents, Providence Academy tenants and the public to enjoy. Uh, the public will have access to this open space into perpetuity, uh, perpetuity, excuse me, via easement. Um, and you, again, you can see these renderings on the right side of the screen of um, at least conceptually what that green space could look like. Um, and then just an inspirational photo on the bottom left. Um, public art summary. So within that green space, there's going to be a significant amount of public art. Um, in the rendering in the upper right hand corner, you can see some blue dots where some of this art will be located. Um, Marathon and Historic Trust will develop a series of historical interpretive centers integrated into the open space as part of its consideration for the property tax exemption. Um, this will include plaques in the locations of all historic structures that existed on site, a monument to the smokestack, historically inspired interactive structures, um, informative art in the enhanced view and pedestrian corridor and historically inspired wayfinding signage. And I'll give you, I'll show you in a second, some more details conceptually of what we're planning for, for that public art in the green space. Uh, the open space will also include additional historical interpretive centers curated and paid for by the historic trust, um, which is uh, part of the historic trust mitigation for the smokestack boil and laundry building, which includes a three-dimensional map of the site that depicts, all, that depicts all historic structures that existed on the site and clear overlay informational board showing the laundry boiler and smokestack structures. And if you look at the conceptual uh, photos in the bottom, um, on the far right, this is a three-dimensional map of the site. So something along those lines will be cre created. Um, then in the center section there, clear overlay boards of some sort um, depicting the smokestack laundry and boiler structures. Um, this is an, just an example of some informational um, boards. And then the plaques on the left side here, that'll be included throughout the site where all the historic structures stood. Aaron? So I'll give you a little more detail on, on what we planned. Again, this is all Aaron? conceptual. Aaron? It's, yep. Can you go back to one slide? You said to interrupt you, so I'm sure. just curious about something. Yep. That sure. bottom right, that bottom right photo, I know that these are proposed options, but I'm curious, yep. is there going to be a part of the smokestack remaining? So it looks to me like in this photo, they have it on top of some kind of brick structure that's circular. So would that be something that would be feasible to have some of the smoke stop in place or is it not really because the buildings will be actually on top of the, the original site? Yeah, that is the, the building, if you can see my cursor here, building E here um, impedes where the existing smokestack is. Um, there has been discussions about trying to recreate a portion of the smokestack or recreate um, one of the boiler building facades, if you've ever looked closely at the boiler building, has some magnificent um, brickwork. So, but I am, I am not the, the creative expert for this. So um, we hire an art consultant um, that works with um, Providence and the Historic Trust and us to curate all of these with artists to come up with creative ideas. I think, and I'll get to this in a second, give you some more detail on these different pieces. Um, I think the smokestack is going to be um, a difficult creative process and to find and come up with something that honors the smokestack without um, simply trying to mimic it in some form. But I'll give you a little more detail on that. But the short answer is no, the intent at this point is not to try and preserve 
um, a portion of the smokestack. The other thing with the smokestack is that the base is, frankly, the, in my opinion, the least interesting part of the smokestack. So I don't, I don't know if that would be the best um, way to spend um, the money we've allocated to honor the smokestack. But I'll give you some more detail on all these pieces now. Um, so this here uh, is a monument to the smokestack. And again, I think this will be the most difficult piece to design just from a creative standpoint. Um, the open space will include a monument to memorialize the historic smokestack. This can be accomplished through elevated landscaping with seating or sculptural element that recreates features of the smokestack. Um, again, we are we very much welcome suggestions um, because this this is, I think, going to be a challenge to do it right. Um, so any suggestions anybody has either tonight or in the future as we start to design these art pieces, it's uh, very much welcomed. So plaques memorializing the past structures. Um, Marathon and Historic Trust are collaborating to locate all structures that have stood on the site throughout history. These locations, whether outside or inside the new buildings, will be marked with plaques. As people wander the site, they'll experience how the site existed throughout history. Um, so we haven't decided what these plaques will look like, but you see some examples down in the lower right-hand corner. Um, and there are many, many structures, as you can see on the site plan on the left, those colored boxes are all different structures that once stood on the site. Um, so I think we're in, in the neighborhood of like 18 structures, 20 structures at this point. So we thought this would be a creative way for, without being too conspicuous, um, people walking the site and understanding what once stood there. And this will tie to um, both the three-dimensional map and um, a map laying out where all the plaques are located. Um, the open space will include a historically inspired interactive structure integrated into the landscape. This will pay homage to the story of the sisters while activating the space by allowing kids and adults to interact with the recreated piece of history. Again, these are conceptual um, inspirational photos um, at the bottom of the site. That is a, a one structure in the middle there that did his, um, in, in history stand on the site. So again, um, how this ends up in the end is up in the air, um, but we have a significant budget allocated for, for this piece. Um, so hopefully it will work out to be something that's interactive um, and also conveys um, some of the history to the public. Um, historical inspired wayfinding. The site will include an historically inspired wayfinding signage throughout. Maps will be installed near the entrances of the site so the public can understand the layout of the site. Additional wayfinding signage will direct the public to specific areas and installations within the site. Um, so I think this is a very important piece to um, make, the, make the site interactive, especially to people that aren't frequently um, at the site. Um, so we plan on doing this throughout the site to, to convey the history and and really wayfind for people to experience the site and the academy building itself. Um, I thought I would give you, um, just show you quickly what the public art from phase one turned out to be because we had a similar presentation to this a few years ago um, about the public art that was done for phase one. So to give you an idea of what we, you know, what we, what we, you know, what we propose and then what, how it came to fruition, um, I thought it'd be a good idea just to touch on this. Um, so we were granted a ta tax exemption for phase one, exchange for public benefits, including public art. Uh, we hired a consultant to curate, design, and commission the art. Um, phase one public art was unanimously approved by the Vancouver Public Art Committee and is under construction now for installation in late summer of this year. Um, so if you can see here this, this site plan, um, we're installing informative art along the facades of building A and B, which is on C Street. There is a sculpture in the plaza that's gonna be created at uh, the corner of East or of Evergreen and C Street. And then there are gateway tile murals that are, that are kind of on each side of the 11th Street access to the site that are creating a gateway. To show you what those are looked like, so this, um, is the is the art that was created and to be installed on the pilasters along the building on 12th Street or C Street, excuse me. Uh, there's 12 locations. Uh, the metal panels cut out to reflect overall shapes inspired by the architecture elements of the academy. Within each shape will be more botanical cutouts representing importance of the gardens on the site historically 
Each will also have rectangular cutout with translucent illuminated panels telling the story of the site. Each story will stand alone and tell a piece of history. So this is just an example of, um, you know, we always intended to provide some kind of informative art along C Street, um, and this is uh, how it came out. So this is being constructed now. Um, these are the tile murals that are at the, um, on each side of the building walls uh, along 11th Street as you enter the site. We also decided to um, angle um, the walls away from the buildings and kind of create a pinch point of, on 11th Street um, so that the murals are more visible from C Street um, and create this, this gateway. So these are you know, 10 by 10 or 11 by 11 uh, murals um, that are done on tile and put on those those large walls along 11th Street. And this uh, being my favorite is a, a 10 foot tall uh, sculpture of an, an ode to, to Mother Joseph. The overall shape of the metal supports replicates the architectural shape of the Academy's chapel. Um, within the metal structure will be sheets of glass cut and stacked with a silhouette of Mother Joseph in the negative space. Um, so this, um, we think this is gonna be a, a fantastic installation. And this is going in the plaza at the corner of C Street at Evergreen. So those are just some examples of how the art pieces actually worked out for phase one. So moving on to the view corridor, um, as Keith mentioned, um, there, there's a heritage overlay requirement that uh, we have a 50 foot wide zero height view corridor. Um, our 12th street view corridor into the academy site is actually 93 feet wide, significantly exceeding the heritage overlays required 50 foot wide view corridor. It also provides a wide view of the academy site and academy building of varying degrees, depending on the perspective within the view corridor as shown below. So you can see on this site plan, the view corridor is highlighted in orange and gives you an idea of what you'll actually be able to see depending on what perspective or where you are standing essentially within that view corridor. So um, some of the things we did to improve this view corridor, um, in working with city staff, staff we um, at one point did, uh, widened it. So it wasn't as wide as it is now. Um, we moved the west facade 17 feet to the east, which resulted in losing apartments and density. Um, that adjustment, however, significantly expanded the view corridor to over 93 feet, um, and which in turn, ex you know, significantly expanded the view of the academy sites um, over what it is required by code. Um, what I think was the, the best part of expanding that view corridor is it created a 30 foot wide pedestrian path. If you can see my cursor here um, on the, along the west side of the phase two buildings. Um, which will really create a nice pedestrian access into the green space and further on into the academy. Um, that wider pedestrian path allows for enhancing the view corridor with art and landscaping to catch the attention of passers-by and draw them to the views of the academy building and site. Um, and um, from 12th Street will lead people to the expansive green space and further south through the green space to the academy building. Um, Within the design team and also talking with city staff, there's a debate about what we do with that 30 foot wide corridor. Um, we can leave it essentially as just sidewalk and landscaping um, to preserve as much of the view as possible. Um, and then we have three other um, art installation ideas that, that we are welcoming feedback on. Um, so again, the idea is to try and catch the attention of passers by, whether driving or walking and pull them into the site, pull them in to see the view of the academy, and then hopefully further on into the site. Uh, the first idea is um, to, along the 30-foot wide pedestrian path, include robust, robust, excuse me, low landscaping, along with uniquely shaped concrete or steel bollards etched with historical information about the academy site. Bollard shape and illumination will catch people's attention and draw them to the view corridor and lead them into the academy site towards the green space and academy building. Another idea is to uh, create a framed entrance to the pedestrian access in the view corridor with informational panels and built in seating to again catch the attention of passers by and draw them into the view corridor and site. Uh, the frame can be designed minimally or even mostly transparent to enhance rather than obstruct views. And then the last idea is to create a mirrored entrance, arranging mirrors so that the views of the of the view the views within the view corridor are reflected towards 12th Street and C Street, 
to again capture the attention of passerby and, and pull them towards the view corridor and the academy site. So again, um, just trying to enhance that view corridor with um, public art that catches people's attention so they're pulled through the site. Um, Aaron? Aaron? Yep. I'm going to interrupt you again. Can you go back two more slides? No. I wanted to see that map that you showed us. Here. Yeah. Here. Um, yes. So, okay. So out of the 93 feet, 30 of that is going to be that pedestrian pathway right there. Yep. Where you're Correct. Okay. Okay. And then the rest is the parking and like a driveway to get through one point to the other point. Correct. Like point building B to A. Okay. Yeah. That's um, the main thoroughfare north south coming through the site. Okay. As you then, go through, would you please pause on art option number two after Julie asked her question? Sure. And and I, I might as well not wait for this. My one of my questions is there are you mentioned in the narrative on page seven about the trees that are going to be removed, and part of the code does state that any tree over 30 feet high really should be avoided to be removed. And there's a whole host of them that you all address in it saying yes, they're going to be removed, but no further comment is made. And I'm just curious if there is a comment to be made <laughs> since that is in the code and just acknowledging that they're going to be taken out doesn't quite address what what the point of that being in the code is, which would keep that green that, you know, that kind of a setback and have some kind of distance from traffic and so forth and some green space. Um, but it doesn't sound like there's any room for that really. It's like the sidewalk and the building immediately and that those yeah. trees are where that was is currently in place yeah so um it, it with the development as planned it is uh, not realistic to try and preserve those trees um we will of course adhere to um the city standards for the street trees but the way we've looked at it is the green space is a form of mitigation for removing those trees um and and that that's essentially our plan we haven't designed exactly how that's going to be landscaped, but we're obviously going to, um, you know, do as much robust landscaping as we can within that area. Um, so that's and, and part of the problem too is a lot of those trees. I mean, I'd have to go back and, and look at them one by one, but it's it's with the city standards for the heritage sidewalk requirements, it's very difficult to retain large what we call right of way street trees. Um, I forget how many of them are on site, but most of the trees that you're mentioning are in the right of way. Um, and it's, it's nearly impossible to, um, comply with the heritage sidewalk requirements and maintain those trees. So I'd have to look at them 1 by 1. Some of them are probably impeded by the building as well. But if I here, I'll show you we can. Yeah. Let me see. You guys actually do you do document what they are. You have a, there's a dogwood tree, 9 maple trees. Oh, yeah, sure. Yep. Um, um a spruce, a plum. I was just so curious. I mean, obviously, you have a lot of green space planned, but not on that side. And those trees are going to be eliminated. So I was just curious, since it is part of the code, that it is addressed. Yeah, and so we can go back. Can't. <laughs> yeah, we can go so, back and look at that. You can see here, we we um, jog the building to create some articulation in the building and interest in the building, rather than having one long facade. So if you can see my cursor here, this. Um, western half of the building is set back from the right of way quite a bit. Um, so there's a, a wider berth here, so to speak, um, from the trees. So in this section, I don't think the trees are necessarily impeding on the building construction. Again, I think the problem with the trees that are located here is um, the heritage sidewalk. Um, but if that if um, if that's of concern, I mean, we can talk to the city and, and we can go one by one and and revisit why those trees are being removed. And if city staff would rather have the trees than the heritage sidewalk, if that is indeed the problem there, then we can we can revisit it. My, I believe that once you get to this portion of the building, the eastern half of that building, there probably is not enough room to maintain the trees there um, given, given the location of the building. But we can. I'm. I'm very happy to revisit that. We we consider tree preservation important. It, sometimes it's um, it's it's very difficult given these developments. Um, but we're going to create a lot of green space and and plant as many you know reasonable trees within that green space as possible. But we. I'll I'll revisit that with staff though. Thanks. I was just curious, and thanks for your response. Sure. 
so, and I'm I, I, sorry, I can't see who's talking when, but um, there was a, a request, I believe, to look at this option for the view corridor enhancement. From one of the commissioners? Yeah, it was um, Andy Gregg asked. I just thought it was interesting that the uh, picture at right was from a park in Russia. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, this, you know, again, these things are quite subjective um, art just in general. Um, I tend to like this first option the best because I think it has the opportunity to catch people's attention without impeding the view much. Um, I, I don't want to leave it as just sidewalk because it just um, it seems like a lost opportunity to make it something special. Um, this one I have a little bit of concern about it impeding the view. Um, and then this one just it, mu it might be a little too interesting, <laughs> frankly, for this. For this site, but we're um, you know we we welcome your feedback and I think whichever one we choose it'll it'll be an enhancement to that pedestrian path. I'd rather not leave it as just a 30 foot wide, you know, concrete sidewalk. So I will continue moving. Um, that's essentially the end of the art and um, the green space. So I will move on to just the, the general design and some of the design elements that we incorporated um, to make sure that the development worked as well as possible with uh, the Providence Academy. Um, th there were several design guidelines that were created, um, and I think the trust called them guiding principles um, that I think Michelle will touch on in a minute. But um, two of these guidelines, and, and this is most of this was formulated with Aegis 1 and just recreated for Aegis 2 because we obviously didn't want to do a different design and make the site any more complicated than it already is. Um, but these design guidelines, we would just try and come back to um, with any design decisions and try and ensure that we're doing um, the right thing for the site from a design standpoint. Um, preservation and possibility, give a historic site new life while embracing its architecture, spirit, and history. Again, trying to revive the site um, you know, large gravel surface parking lot, um, not, the, not the best use for the site or the most inviting for the site. So trying to give new life to the site. And then the more complicated piece of it is compatibility. Um, so this guideline, create a compatible juxta juxtaposition of old and new, which is far easier said than done, um, while employing current design techniques to accommodate modern needs while incorporating traditional architectural elements to showcase the Academy's inspired history. So we kept coming back to this one. Um, again, modern buildings have modern needs, such as lots of, you know, lots of glass, lots of windows. Um, so try and um, adhere to those modern needs while still incorporating a traditional architectural elements to tie it together with the Academy. And also not to create too much juxtaposition. I mean, make sure that it was compatible. So to touch on some of the more specifics, um, the design team utilized the same compatible juxtaposition as old, of old and new used in Aegis 1, Aegis 2 complement the academy rather than mimic it. So we didn't want to try and recreate um, the academy. We didn't want to use all red brick to create a giant sea of red brick. Um, so try and complement the academy rather than mimic it. And again, all, all easier said than done. Uh, this was accomplished by employing current design to accommodate modern needs while incorporating traditional architectural elements to showcase the academy's history. So structured, clean, and rectangular forms were employed and paired with robust landscaping plazas and interpretive art to create a frame around the academy. Um, Aegis II was designed with minimal articulation and complexity to limit distraction from the academy. So we, many of our designs are, are much more complicated than this academy design or the, the Aegis design. And we just didn't want to complicate it because we didn't want to detract from the academy. So we wanted the academy um, to be the focus of the site and the Aegis buildings just to frame it. Um, so some of the specifics of what we did to, to make that work. 
Um, simple facades and clean lines frame and highlight the academy. Um, mostly brick cladding is the same material and texture of the academy. Uh, neutral palette on the upper floors provides some contrast from the academy, but allowing the academy to remain the focus of the site and not create stark contrast between old and new. Uh, red brick on the upper portions of the sides connects to the academy and creates a cohesive campus feel from the distance perspective. Um, from the closer perspective, the dark colored brick base and the academy stone base both form, you know, form anchors for the buildings. Uh, the brick size and layout closely resembles the academy's brick size and layout. Um, traditional brick elements uh, soldier courses, pilasters, other brick detailing infused traditional elements um, from the close perspective. Um, rhythmic and symmetrical window layout similar to the academy's window layout. Um, red brick base on the building and red brick pathways throughout the site creates a cohesive campus feel from the pedestrian perspective. So from the pedestrian perspective, the, the red brick pathways and plazas and the cohesive landscaping throughout will hopefully make the whole site tie together from the pedestrian perspective. It's difficult to get a feel for that in looking at these renderings, um, but I think we did a pretty good job in the design of the site so that it feels comfortable and cohesive. Um, cement panels on the upper floors of the buildings create some um, depth relief in the facade without excessive articulation. Again, trying not to articulate the building or make it too complicated to dis which would distract from the academy. Uh, in abstract and inf inf informational historic art throughout the site connects Aegis and the academy to the site's history and provides context for the public that are utilizing the site. Um, we created arch entrances at the window or at the at the entrance awnings mimicking the academy's arch windows. Um, again, the public green space um, allowing the academy tenants, Aegis residents, and the public to enjoy open space. Cohesive landscaping and earth tone exterior palettes of Aegis II and the academy blend with the campus landscaping. And then just to touch on the public engagement summary, we, we and the trust um, did an extensive public outreach for this project, um, both for phase one and phase two. It, uh, involved um, open house, several open houses, uh, stakeholder interviews and conferences, um, online public forums, uh, many, many um, uh, meetings with city planning staff. Uh, we also formed uh, an acad what we called the Academy Advisory Team. This was um, members of the public, other design professionals, architects, developers, um, stakeholders, to help us digest all of the public comments to then formulate design revisions based on those comments. Because that that is also easier said than done, taking comments from the public and um, turning it into actual design revisions. So that was that was a great idea and very helpful. Um, so with that, that's the end of the presentation. I'm again happy to talk about specifics of any of these elements, go back through the presentation to look at things more in detail if you like or answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. You're welcome. And so, uh, first of all, we'll ask if any other Historic Preservation Commissioners have questions of the applicant. I don't think I have any questions. I just have a, a comment after the presentation, which was, which was great. I think that you really have taken the applicant and everybody has really taken a lot of time in putting this application together. I just really uh, want to uh, mimic the words that you said about how the academy is the centerpiece. And when we're talking about that enhanced view corridor and trying to bring people in to remember that that is the centerpiece, so we don't want to overwhelm it. I know that you had three options and like, you know, number three was just almost giving me a headache. Um, <laughs> like I, I would, that would just send me screaming, you know, I mean, I'm not saying you're doing that one. <laughs> I'm just saying for instance, um, you know, uh, just really, you know, really utilize that open space that you've created. I think that was really a, a great mitigation to open up uh, that view, that view. And, um, you know, number one is great. We don't want to get too big, though, right? We don't want them to be, you know, Greek pillars. <laughs> right? 
instance. You know, um, so I love the idea of drawing people in. I just wanted to remind um, the applicant that, you know, just like you said, uh, the academy is the centerpiece. You know, and, and height is an issue in these viewed spaces. So just to to remember that while you're while you're um, developing these these options, I think that you guys are really on point, and you're and you're listening to people's um people's um, ideas, and I'm, I really appreciate that. Um, that was the only thing that really kind of stuck out to me was I was really excited to see that 93 feet, and I and I even if part of it is you know for driving, you know I really like to see that open view when I'm walking down. C Street, you know, and or 12th Street there. So thank you for that. Yeah, th and thanks for the feedback. We um, uh, we found it very important to make sure that there's several entrances to the site, and then we do the best we can to kind of create gateways. So the plaza at the corner of C Street and Evergreen is going to be a, a fast, a fantastic addition. And from the pedestrian perspective, really, I think pull people into the site. From what else? I'll, you know, say is the most important perspective along Evergreen Boulevard and C Street down there. Um, but then, yeah, at, at at 11th Street, you know, we are creating those tile murals, which will hopefully catch people's attention and pull them into the site. And this is the idea along 12th Street, which is the, the least utilized street surrounding the academy. Um, but from where this is, I think it will catch the attention of some people coming down C Street. And then certainly catch the attention of anybody that's coming down 12th Street. So and how, how we do that is is kind of is the question. Um, but we didn't want to we didn't want to leave it plain because um, we thought it was important to all these entrances to some degree form gateways and pull people into the site. I have some comments, but I already spoke, so I want to make sure other commissioners get a chance first. So. Andy, just know that I'm just going to wait my turn. <laughs> okay. Well, I, hearing no further uh, comment, we'll hear from. Uh, and do, oh, who else? Sorry. Oh, this is Paige. Okay. Um, Paige, please go ahead. Yeah, great. Thank you. I just have a few things to say. Um, I wanted to say thanks for the extensive and well thought out information you prov provided. Um, it'll be nice to see the space transformed. And utilized and showcasing the main academy building um, from different view corridors. Um, I appreciated the care that was taken in the iterations explored in the layout of the grounds and the green space, um, specifically for view corridor on 12th Street. Um, the fact that the 12th Street view corridor is almost double what's required for the zero height requirements, smart planning and um, <laughs> respects the academy as a landmark. Um, the green space, you know, roughly an acre, it's amazing. And um, this amenity is appealing and hopefully will encourage uh, part of the city to be uh, used more and um, an upgrade to the existing landscape uh, by far. <laughs> um, I think that those start to align a lot of the parking on the east um, of the lot parallel to I-5 um, this less desirable part of the lot and probably uh, the noisiest. And I appreciated that the parking garage is essentially hidden and that's a huge plus. Um, and uh, appreciate that the money from the land sales is going back into the academy. I think that's really great. Um, that being said, I don't necessarily think that the architecture of the new development fits the historic surroundings. Um, I feel that like the boxy condominium boom that this development encompasses is a design issue that a lot of cities face today. And um, as well, these developments don't offer affordable housing opportunities and therefore not necessarily an answer to uh, rising living costs and the need for lower income housing in the city. Um, it's not that the buildings are the issue. Um, it's just that there are so many of them and everywhere you look, it's similar. And I feel that on this site, it slightly brings down the integrity of the academy, but I'd hope that more sensitivity to the fact that this is within a historic, um, overlaid district would have encouraged a different kind of architecture, but I do like, I do appreciate all the work that's gone into it and I 
do think it's definitely an upgrade, you know, from what's currently there. Um, I just had a few more comments just to mirror what Julie had said about uh, the smokestack. Um, I was, I don't know, like, I'm not sure the logistics about disassembly of the smokestack, but I thought it would have been cool maybe to do like take like the top portion of the smokestack and maybe like reassemble it somewhere just so um, it could remind people that it once stood there and then give it some type of like a nod to the actual scale of what it once was. Um, and then my last comment is I didn't see a roof plan in the design content provided, but um, it would have been maybe nice to see some type of partial green space on the roof that could collect rainwater or just reduce um, the fact that these buildings act as uh, urban heat islands. I mean, it's a really big building. And I just think that sometimes, you know, uh, contributes to overall temperatures rising. Um, as well as the parking lots. And I do appreciate that you did steer away from that one design that had parking lots everywhere. So I do appreciate that as well. Um, that was basically my comments, but uh, thank you so much for, for the presentation. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, thanks for the comments. Just to touch on a, a few things quickly, um, you know, the call it boxy rectangular shapes of these buildings, um, it's for this site is that that's not a cost um issue the buildings are mostly brick which is actually quite expensive um and the issue really was creating something simple that wouldn't the architecture itself wouldn't detract from the academy but these um they're very subjective things that were debated greatly um not so much with phase two but with phase one before before the design which was carried over from phase one was finalized um, as to the smokestack, um, recreating the top portion of the smokestack, which has the detailed brickwork, is definitely on the list um, of potentials to memorialize the smokestack. Um, if, if, if that's something that's feasible to do, it's going to be on the short list. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Julie, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for letting me interrupt during your presentation. <laughs> and um, my colleagues have actually said a lot of the positive things that I um, have been thinking throughout the presentation. So I will say, I will just piggyback on their positive words and say thank you for your presentation and the information that you shared with us. I have a few just concerns that I'm going to share. I know that this is simply an advisory meeting. Um, but I do want to just share some thoughts that I know are subjective, but I, I really do want to echo um, what Paige said in terms of the design of the buildings. Um, I, I understand the need for simplicity, but I think they still could have had some elegance, some historical elegance to have added to the site that they don't have and won't ever have. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to enhance them to do so. Um, I think one thing that really I, I recognize the intent is to make the the Providence Academy building the focal point, but I think instead they're such huge buildings that they really encapsulate it. They really block it off, even though there are these corridors, which I appreciate. But the the entire phase two completely blocks off, other than that one corridor, the entire like um, northern and then eastern side other than the parking lot, but that the massing just is a bit of a concern for me. I feel like that that in a sense is goes against that intent, which is that the Providence Academy be the focal point. I feel like it, it's now kind of dwarfed. Um, I also um, looking at it, the I think the black, all of the black balconies really draws my eye away from the Academy and because it's completely surrounding the academy, I I don't feel the academy really is standing out like we hoped it would. I don't know if that is something set in stone, if that can be softened, um, but it really, everything on the academy is these creamy, warm tones, and then there's this very stark black. Um, all of the windows, all of the balconies, 
um, it just really is a contrast that I feel is, uh, is incongruent with each other. Um, and I know that also in the, in the presentation and in the materials presented, you know, 70 some odd percent of these buildings are made of brick, which is great. And I recognize the desire to not mimic the academy at all, but I, I don't feel it's, it's even in the same school, um, other than they're both buildings with windows and doors. Um, the styles are significantly different. And so I feel like it would be okay to have a little more red brick in those buildings to complement the academy, to draw the eye to the academy, to kind of create a little bit more cohesion. Um, I appreciate that the, the, the intent was to kind of keep in the, the color scheme, but I do think maybe a little more red and a little less of the beigey beige. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to describe that color um, as I look through it. And it just, it just seems incongruous to me. Um, I, I, they just don't seem to complement each other in terms of style. And, and I, I completely understand the viewpoint that you expressed and the, the philosophy around the, the simplicity. Um, but I, I just don't feel that they're enhancing the site. I feel like they actually are doing a little bit of takeaway because of the, um, the stark contrast and, and also the bulk, how big they are, how they, how they pretty much wrap around the academy other than um, evergreen. So those are just some concerns that I had, but particularly, I don't know if there's any room for flexibility, but that those black balconies, everything that really draws my eye, takes my eye completely away from the academy and goes right to those very simple buildings. Um, and I don't know how the general public will be, but um, that's just kind of a, like you said, a subjective thing. I do appreciate the green space though. I think the green space is exciting. And I think the plans that, that are being proposed are exciting. And, um, you know, as everyone has said, it's, it's, it'll be nice to have this um, site um, that is welcoming to the public and that place for, you know, for another place on the Vancouver um, map to congregate and enjoy. Uh Thank you. Thank you. And, and let me express that um, all of your comments are um, not unique. These, these are all issues that were very much debated over the last four or five years in developing the site. Um, you know, the color scheme is baked mostly because Aegis One is under construction and, and we wouldn't want to, you know, vary from that just because we, we'd end up with even more complexity on the site. Um, the the black um, one of the issues is window color. There are not a lot of options when it comes to window color. We did not want to do white. Um, the yellowish tone that's on the academy was going to be impossible to recreate. Um, so the decision was made to use black. So I think a lot of the black that you're seeing is actually um, louvers and window frame because there's not a lot of balconies on the site but yeah where there is balconies it's a stack of black which which i i appreciate isn't um you know isn't necessarily the most attractive thing the alternatives though um were decided to be not any better you know white would would not have would not have worked out well um the brick um that was how we debated as well as how much red brick do you want and does uh you know too much red brick take away from the academy. Um, so the decision was made that we should have highlights of red brick to tie it together, um, but that we needed contrast from the academy to the buildings that are surrounding it. Um, from a massing perspective, uh, we very much appreciate that phase two has a lot of mass. Um, that, you know, that stems from creating the green space. And the issue really becomes which to some degree is always part of the decision economics in that if you want, if you want to build a parking garage, um, you need a lot of density in apartments to afford that parking garage. They're just extremely expensive and in no way pay for themselves. So the income that will be derived from the parking probably pays for 25% of the parking garage. So the only way to pay for a parking garage um, is to have a lot of density. So the alternative was a lot of surface parking in smaller buildings. So essentially the trade-off is the green space for the massing, the density. 
Um, and when we looked at those options, you know, you know, four story buildings or five story buildings instead of what we have or, you know, smaller footprint because you don't have the parking garage, um, you end up with a sea of parking rather than green space. And you still are blocking uh, quite a bit of the view to the academy. So, um, yes, there's a lot of mass. Um, you know, we in the Historic Trust analyzed it at length um, that we would prefer to have that mass and have this green space. It's just the reality of, of what we do. Um, so, Can that yes, it, the if, you didn't, if you didn't have the parking garage footprint, you'd have smaller footprints and shorter buildings, um, but you wouldn't have the green space. You'd have a lot of parking. Um, is the parking garage going to be public parking or is it going to simply be for the residents? It's intended for the residents to the extent the residents don't use it. Yes, it'll be made available to the public. Um, the reality is I wouldn't expect the public to use it given its location other than for people utilizing the academy. So academy tenants or, you know, people coming, you know, coming and using the academy in some fashion. Um, our parking ratio is, I think, like 0.85 to the development as a whole. So um, I expect most of it will be used by the tenants, um, but that remains to be seen. It depends how much you know mass transportation is, you know, continues to be used. Whether the bridge is done and mass transportation is made more available, um, but at this point, I, we expect it to be used mostly by the tenants. And is it is the is the bulk of it the mass of it? Uh, because of some calculation of the tenants that will be there, like, will it be at max capacity? What what capacity is it expected to be at the size that it is with the apartments and so forth? Yeah, we expect it to be mass capacity. The, the parking is extremely expensive to build, so we wouldn't build one more space than we think <laughs> we need for in, in that parking garage. Um, so, so yes, we, we expect it to be used um, okay. and be full. And just to follow on to Paige's question, and I don't, I don't know if you answered, was the garden space on the roof? Has there been any consideration of that? I think her point was well made, and I won't repeat it. But if, if you might comment on uh, the short, that. the short answer is no. Um, and the the energy code in Washington is quite stringent, and um, already adds a, a lot of cost, frankly, to just what we were doing a few years ago. And these buildings are you know, very efficient. Um, everything will be LEED certified. We don't know if it will be silver or gold yet, but it'll be LEED certified. Um, so no, that that is not intended. Um, green roofs um, are generally expensive because of weight. So it becomes, that, that really becomes the issue is the structural cost that's associated with it. So, um, you know, again, all these things are trade-offs of, of where do you spend the money and still maintain economic viability. Frankly, the by far the the most economically favorable option for this site was a lot of surface parking and and very little green space, which um, I just I you know I couldn't do, so we're not doing that. But there are limits to what you can do economically. Just one last question. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry, Paige. No, you're good. <laughs> I thought that was me echoing. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You had said earlier, if we do have some thoughts or suggestions for some of the artistic, um, you know, things that are on the table, how do we share those thoughts? And where, where is there a public forum somewhere? Um, no, but uh, you should just reach out to us. Um, so I'll share my contact information and Annie in my office is the project manager for this project and she likes nothing, she's probably listening right now. She likes nothing more than to talk about these art pieces. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's uh, again, the, I am not the person for sure to be deciding, you know, what should be what with art in the creative process. <laughs> um, but we do have people involved and we welcome, you know, we welcome all the suggestions. Thanks. So I'll, we'll just make ourselves available to you. Thank you. Uh, the one last thing. Any question further questions? Have. Go ahead, Paige. Yeah, you moved the uh, entrance. You said you moved the entrance of the building to the west side of Building C. Um, the original was to have retail there, and you forego uh, 
you abandon that idea. My my question just was, is there still going to be glazing on the northwest and south sides of the entrance as well? So then you can still kind of get a little bit more of that view into the green space. Yeah, so yeah. Um, this this whole west end will still be what we call storefront glass. Um, OK, cool. so large glass and then. This section here is is going to be uh, indoor outdoor terrace. So quite often that will be completely open space. Um, Very cool. There'll Thanks. be some obstructions in there, but the intent is to keep it as transparent as possible. Great, thank you. I just so this is Jan. Um, and between my colleagues, they've covered all the issues that I want to brought up. I guess the one thing I would say about the green space, which is amazing, is. And we're taking out a lot of mature trees and I, I realize when you, you know, do new green space, you put in relatively small trees. So it's not going to look like this picture right out of the gate. So I would really urge you to try to at least put in a few large scale trees so that it's not just uh, doesn't look like we've mowed everything down and it's going to take 15 years for things to fill in. And that's all I have. The rest of it was covered. I yeah, I we I hear that um, th that the landscaping has not th the open space has not yet been designed. Um, this is conceptual, um, but I, I hear you that I mean you go to new developments and um, it just it seems very sterile. I mean this site there's no way to for it to really feel sterile given the academy building, but yeah it feels very sterile because of the the trees aren't yet mature and you got to wait 15 years. Mm -hmm. So we're you know we're very conscious and we'll be sensitive to that. I, we, you know, Annie and I have gone to length as much as looking at um, transplanting large trees at, in developments because we appreciate the trees so much. It usually doesn't work out, unfortunately, um, but we we will look at um, planting as many mature trees as possible. Yeah, it's too bad that the trees that are going to be removed couldn't. I, I realize you can't hold on to a, a tree for 18 months or two years while something's under construction, but seems a shame to pull out mature trees and then put in tiny little ones. So, so yeah, that would be appreciated if you could just uh, look at some way to make the landscaping look a little more finished right out of the gate. We will do our best. The, the green space is, um, you know, we've gone to great lengths to make this green space feasible. So we, we, um, we're going to make it as nice as we can. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, I also want to thank you for the presentation. I thought it was excellent and it really demonstrates, you know, the thoughtful, uh, process that you've gone through. To develop, you know, the, the vision, uh, to this point. Um, so thank you for. Engaging with the community and with the city staff and all the stakeholders to. To develop this to this point, um. Uh, uh, my, the comments from my fellow commissioners yeah. are all really well taken as well, and and particularly uh, with regard to yeah. the roof of the building. Um, I wanted to focus on the roof a bit, and you know I don't know if this yeah. ship, if this ship has sailed, but um, there really isn't a lot of vertical articulation at all on on the roof, and that contributes to the overall sense of you know the the mass of the of the structure um, and it gives it kind of a fortress like uh, appearance. Um, there may still be some architectural sleight of hand uh, that you can uh, uh, take a look at to try to to give that roof line some articulation. Um, I think that would help reduce that um, that sense of mass and the sense of that you know we're that the building is, is going to just create this, this wall. If you break the, the roof line a bit, um, and on the, the parking structure, uh. I don't see a lot of detail on what the exterior of the parking structure that is visible. From, um, you know, the north and the east is going to look like. So, if. If you can, you know, take a look at what can be done to soften the appearance of that uh, from those vantage points as well, because it will be visible, um, you know, from from the north and from from the east. Um, 
And uh, I don't know if these discussions have been held with the city, but you know, because of the the location of this development and accessibility to existing transit and likely future transit options, seems like you could make a pretty good case for parking reduction um, to try to further reduce the the expense of the parking structure as well as the mass of of the overall structure. Um, you know, if if anywhere, if any place is going to have a parking reduction, uh, it's a place that's that's pretty much in in a location like this. Um, uh, particularly given the other uh, cost issues that are coming into play with uh, preservation of the historic elements of the site. Um, and then lastly, on the the uh, driveway, you know into the site that is also the 93 foot view corridor. Um, whatever you can do with the um, uh, improvements to that um, driveway uh, in terms of the paving materials, the, the site improvements, landscaping, lighting, um, uh, pedestrian oriented amenities, et cetera. If you can really focus on um, Trying to think of that corridor as not just a driveway, but as really uh, a major uh, amenity and uh, pedestrian en enhancement um, to the site. Uh, we don't, you know, we just have a preliminary landscape plan, so we don't know a lot of detail about, you know, what the thought process is going to be for the pavement, for the pedestrian furniture, for the lighting, for the landscaping. Etc. And that that paying attention to all those details in that corridor will really um, enhance the overall value of that um, uh, as a as an aesthetic feature of the site. Um, and I just do do have one quick question. Um, I didn't see how the um, stormwater requirements are going to be addressed on this site. Is there going to be? Can you maybe just briefly? Discuss how that's going to be addressed. Is that going to be a some kind of detention or underground uh, containment, or you know, how's this going to be dealt with? Um, okay, so uh, a few things. First, on the stormwater, um, the there's pretty good percolation at this site, so um, there'll be some detention, and then I think on phase one we used um, large underground. Um, pipes that percolate. So essentially large dry wells um, under the parking lot to percolate. So there are some um, retention swales, so to speak, um, that are landscaped. We have not designed that yet for phase two. Um, there will be some, some of that. Most of it will be around the parking areas. Um, so you can see there, you can't see it on here, but there are a few right in here um, that are serving some of this parking. So along the parking, you'll have some of that. Most of it goes into underground detention. Um, from as far as enhancing this pedestrian corridor, um, we're gonna. I mean, I showed you some of that. We're gonna do the the best we can to to enhance that pedestrian path. This will be most likely paved um, and is already part of Aegis One's construction. If you can follow my cursor here, you see this different colored pathways here. This is all red brick pavers. So we have gone um, to quite a few lengths to try and create as much interest in the pedestrian experience as possible. And you'll see a lot of that on the southern end here. This plaza is all red brick pavers. And we carried that across the, the parking lot here. So there's a pedestrian connection that feeds across from the plaza to what will eventually be some sort of a plaza in front of the academy. So we'll do some of that uh, similar stuff on this on the back side off 12th Street with that pedestrian with that wider pedestrian corridor. Um, and I think that was your comments. Um, oh, so parking reduction. Um, you can there are parking reductions available if you have retail space. Um, I don't think it gets you below a <laughs> 0.75 if I'm not mistaken is the lowest you can get. Um, the reality is from a market standpoint, at least today, um, that you, you need that much parking. Because even if people are using mass transportation, 
most everybody has a car. It's just a matter of whether they're using their car every day. Um, so in Portland, we can typically get away with like 0.5 to 0.6 parking ratio. Um, we think we're going to need a little more up in Vancouver. Most of our competition actually has a higher parking ratio, more like a one-to-one -one parking ratio. So I don't think in today's market we could get away with um, much less parking. And as far as the footprint of the parking garage is concerned, uh, you can only make the footprint of a parking garage so small because as you make it smaller, you make the drive lane steeper and it becomes very inefficient and very uh, not so user friendly the smaller you make the footprint. Um, so there was only so much we could do with the parking garage. If you start eliminating parking spaces, you really eliminate floors rather than the footprint of the parking garage. So um, there, there would only be so much savings in the footprint of the site, no matter how much parking you, you remove. Yeah, it's, it's not really an issue of the footprint. It's, you know, an issue of, you know, can you reduce the mass of that overall structure maybe by not making it a full top level parking? Maybe you can reduce that top level and incorporate some of those green landscape elements that um, Paige was talking about rather than having a be a full parking deck on the upper level. Uh, um, and is the upper level, by the way, um, is that just going to be an open surface parking deck, right? Yep. Um, it's it's so shorter. It's shorter than the. It's I think it's. I want to say we're three and a half levels at this point, so it's significantly shorter than the buildings that surround it, and it's you know it's screened from the from the front side. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, concrete structure um, to create green roof is just economically not viable you'd, you'd be you'd be better off trying to put green roof on the on the buildings than on the parking garage it's just the parking garage is extremely expensive okay well thank you for your comments yeah thank you thank you everyone um does any member of the public have a comment Staff will now provide instructions on how to make public comment for those joining us through their computer, mobile device, and for those joining by telephone, audio only. Susan? Okay, let me switch the presentation over quick. Okay, for attendees using their computer or the WebEx application, if you would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand following the directions on the screen. For attendees using the telephone, you need to press star three on your phone's number panel to raise your hand. Staff will acknowledge those who have raised their hand and unmute you, unmute you one at a time. When you have finished your comment, please lower your hand. On a com computer, you can do this by clicking on the hand icon again. On the phone, you can press star three. Please note public comment is limited to three minutes per person in order to accommodate all speakers. And I just, I'm sorry, this is Michelle Reeves and we had some technical difficulties for whatever reason, the um, I'm clicking on that and I'm trying to slide it. It's just not working. So can I just get into the list for um, having my hand raised? Cause it, it won't raise. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. Why don't we start with you? Oh, okay, great. Uh, sorry to jump in there like that. So I'm going to briefly just uh, start my video to say hi to everyone, because I know I'm new to this group. Let's see if this works. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still I'm oh, okay, moving it over to you. Give me one second. All right, and is share working? I'm sorry. Hmm. Well, screen share wasn't great out before, but now it is. Are you able to? Um, for some reason, I'm having troubles. Well, if you want to let like Lee or John go, that's fine. And we can see if we can tackle this. Yeah, maybe we can allow somebody else to okay. get started Perfect. and I will work on that while we. Uh, 
And there was someone with their hand up. I'll s I'm going to start with Glenn Young because he's first on my um, on my list. Glenn, you should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify real quick, and I apologize. I'm, the the agenda is a bit unclear. Am I only able to testify on this particular project or this particular hearing, or is there other issues that I can speak to? This hearing only, please. Okay. All right. Uh, I had more information for other things, but I will say that um, you know I've been in involved in some of this process and it's been a rough go. There's no question about it. It's a challenge. It's something that's very, um, it's, it's a jewel, you know, that can't be replaced. There's no question about it. And so it's been a tough issue. I appreciate the conversation that's taken place. And I pretty much share all of the concerns that I've heard from the commissioners, but I don't have expertise in this particular area. So I just won't say much other than that. I did have other comments. I don't know if there's any other part of the agenda where that those can be addressed. Mr. Young, uh, at the beginning of every meeting, we offer public comment for items not on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't there at that moment. I didn't see it on the agenda. So I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, yes, it's, it's right after uh, approval of the minutes and before we had the public hearing on the certificate of appropriateness for the old city cemetery. And during that period, uh, Holly Chamberlain gave the update for the uh, for the trust. So we have had that. Okay, I will. I'll I'll try to hit you at the next meeting. Then thank you. Appreciate it. We we will welcome you uh, at the March meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, I made uh, Michelle a presenter now, so you should be able to share your screen. And Michelle, if you're speaking, you are muted. Yep, no, it just took me a second to, I don't use WebEx a ton. So uh, my name is Michelle Reeves and I am the new, and by new, I mean day 12 new president at the trust. And I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today. I wanted to just briefly share that even though I am New to the trust, for those of you who don't know me, I am not new to Vancouver. So for the last 12 years that I've spent working in adaptive reuse and economic development, um, I have collaborated very extensively with downtown in Fruit Valley on 4th Plain and in the Evergreen School District. So today I want to share five reasons with you why the trust supports this project. And the first is because it creates appropriate urban fabric for a downtown, which is where this project is located. So for a downtown to be successful, it must have connectivity at the ground level with buildings built up to the sidewalk and next to each other. So adding this next new round of buildings is how cities have always developed. And it just reminded me of when I was in York, England, right before the pandemic. You walk around and you think, you know, yeah, these buildings are pretty old. And then you just round a corner and you see something that's much older. So adding the new next to the old is how we have always changed and expanded our cities. The second reason we support the project is that it brings over 18 hours of activity to this super block site. So to be economically successful and safe, downtowns have to have eyeballs on the street, as Jane Jacobs like to point out. All phases of work on this site together with the Academy bring activity and eyeballs through retail, service, office, and residential uses. Reason number three we support this is that the intensification of this is adding hundreds of housing units and in our region, we all need to be doing everything we can to increase our supply of all types of housing to meet increased demand. 
The fourth reason that we support this project at the Trust is that although the site is being intensified, the amount of land area devoted to parking is being massively decreased from what it was, which was roughly the giant red cross house area that you see behind this older photo of all the parking around the academy. The fifth reason that we support this project is because there will be the green space that everyone's been talking about in the back of the academy. And after we upgrade the front landscaping, there's going to be this lovely park like setting for the public to enjoy and appreciate the academy from all kinds of different viewpoints. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on here today, it's kind of a little bit of a, um, I guess I would call it a fangirl moment for Vancouver. So it is really, really tough. It's a tricky proposition to tackle these kinds of large historic buildings, like the one pictured here, which is almost the same square footage as the Academy, uh, because it takes tens of millions of dollars in building wide upgrades just to make them not fall apart. And you get no offsetting rent for the, those kinds of investments. So this is the former sanatorium at Hot Lake Springs in LaGrande in Eastern Oregon. And private investors over the last few decades have managed to fix up some of that on the outside. But there's been a lot of outbuilding loss, largely due to vacancies, and then the inside remains mostly either not updated or not usable. So the fact that you guys as a city were able to get such an important asset in the hands of a preservation focused nonprofit while fostering a development project that is so responsive to the surrounding downtown is fantastic. And I just want you guys to know that I am 100% going to be sharing this nationally as a great example of how to save a building and how to improve a downtown. And it is exactly why I am super excited um, to be working with you guys. So I wanted to stop screen sharing. Let me, oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Can I get out of screen share, Susan? Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. Sorry. I am not a WebEx whiz. I'm a Zoom whiz. Um, so that is the end of my testimony, but I wanted to see if it would be okay if I took another less than three minute window to read Sister of Providence Suzanne Hartung's letter into the record as separate testimony because she was hoping to be present tonight, but she had a conflict arise and was not able to be here. So if that would be okay, I would like to do that. You've been provided to us as part of the public testimony. So we already have, unless it's a different letter than the one that she originally sent. So um, I'm not sure if if that's, so I, I just wanted to ask, and if, if you guys don't want me to, that's totally fine. I, I think that last time it was read into the testimony and she wanted to be here. So I just wanted to offer that out there, but I know it's getting late. So happy to not do it. Andy, up to you. We were all in. We were all in receipt of the letter, so we've, okay. we've read it and it's available. Perfect. Okay, then that's the end of my comments. Thank you very much. Okay, I think Lee Rafferty is Any? next on the list. Oh, my apologies, Andy. Okay, no problem. I was just about to ask if there was any further comment. Okay, Lee. Hey, hello, everyone. Now. I'm my I'm croaky. I'm sorry about that. I haven't talked much today, and I've been listening <clears throat> with lots of interest to what's been shared. Aaron, I loved your presentation. I got to see a lot more than I had seen earlier of phase one. <clears throat> the term that I have learned tonight that I like the most is compatible juxtaposition. I think that's a you know that is a good one. Um, I started my downtown career 41 years ago in a building that was torn down to make room for the library. I drive past this site every day. So at least for 41 years, I have loved, I have loved, loved, loved this site. And I've wondered, you know, how could it be? Change is always so hard. And um, sorry, I've got a call coming in. Of course, that's what happens. Anyway. So for 41 years, I have loved this site and been very involved with it. And um, I thought, well, change is hard for everybody. How are they gonna turn this site into something that is really welcoming and interesting and connects past, present and future? This is, this is the big challenge. And like Aaron has said, it's easier said than done. Um, so 41 years later, 
here I am, I'm retired from my jobs in downtown Vancouver, but I do have the privilege of serving on a commission that the city of Vancouver has developed. It's the Culture, Arts and Heritage Commission. And additionally, I serve as the chair of the Public Art Committee that Aaron mentioned earlier. And we were able to see a presentation of fresh, very appropriate, very respectful art that has been developed for this site. And I'm excited to tell you, yes, we unanimously accepted their, um, their ideas for what would be brought to public art in that, in this space. It is, a, I am really impressed with what Aaron has presented. I think the storytelling is excellent. I think the engagement is excellent. The variety of artistic pursuits and disciplines, excellent. The sight lines, yes, we're adding a lot to the site, uh, site S-I-T-E, and it's going to create some barriers, but the sight lines that have been created, I think, are really appropriate and important. I think that the buildings have presented, they're a canvas. This is, this is a place where we can put more interesting things. I mean, give me a parking garage any day, and we'll find a way to make it interesting. Um, I, I just am very excited about all the possibilities here. It's fresh, uh, it will be engaging, and I think it's gonna be most of all in what we're concerned about in this meeting. It's very, very respectful of the history. Um, what I would like to see going forward is more, I'm sure that there'll be a way to be bringing this to the public so that they can um, appreciate all the, um, back and forth deliberation that's happened. I really have been impressed with the commissioners in this meeting that have brought their ideas and um, and Aaron's responses have been very, very respectful for the, to those as well. I am, as a private citizen, as somebody who has worked with Michelle previously on how to create that urban fabric that she mentioned earlier, how to create um, strong nodes that will connect from one to another to create a downtown that is really well traveled and explored. I think this is excellent and I'm so excited here 41 years after opening a business um, at 8, oh, let's see, it was 301 Evergreen Boulevard across from Ron Century House. <laughs> and that's where I got my lunch. <laughs> Andy, you know a Ron Century House, yeah. Uh, now, I certainly to, uh, do, Lee. Uh, yeah, um, we've been around a while, haven't we? Uh, I am just, I'm really excited to see the next iteration uh, of this site and what it's going to bring to the city and to visitors and our residents. I think it's outstanding. Change is hard, but I think this is pretty well thought out change and it will pencil. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much yourself for uh, for contributing. Susan, any further uh, public comment? Yes, the next person on the list is John McDonough. Thank you, Susan, Chair Greg, and commissioners. Uh, I'm John McDonough, President and CEO of the Greater Vancouver Chamber of Commerce. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity to provide comment on uh, phase two of the Aegis uh, development. Um, this is the third time uh, over the course of this development that I've had the opportunity to provide uh, supportive testimony. And as I've offered in the past, uh, the trust, I, uh, historic trust, I think is to be congratulated in its creative way of funding the preservation of the Providence Academy. It's unfortunate that more of the property didn't receive the attention uh, the Academy did over the years, uh, but we now have a steward of that facility and it will continue to help us to tell the Vancouver story. Regarding phase two of the development uh, around the Academy building, I'm impressed with uh, Marathon's commitment to have the new structures be reflective of the original, as a number of the other uh, speakers have addressed as well as the incorporation of that uh, green space in the interior of the campus, 
which will allow visitors to casually enjoy the restored academy. Lastly, the activation of this portion of downtown will add vitality to the surrounding businesses and through the new businesses that will be added. Especially coming out of the pandemic years, customers who are local and can be regular supporters will provide the trade that will assure the sustainability of the business community in downtown. Happy to address any questions you might have of me, and I encourage your support for phase two of the Planet at the Academy site. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person on the list is Michael Walker. Hi there, can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. I appreciate your time tonight. My name is Michael Walker. I'm the executive director of the Vancouver's Downtown Association. And I just wanted to know and reaffirm that the VDA Board of Directors has submitted a letter in full support of the project. And uh, the, the board believes that this proposed plan will move forward a long established vision uh, for both greater housing density and commercial activity in downtown, all while activating and connecting Officers Row uh, with Fort Vancouver to our urban core. And uh, we believe that the phase two will continue to improve the co-compliance of the site while providing uh, fiscal sustainability for Providence Academy, an important step in ensuring that the site is well stewarded uh, for future generations. And the VDA board and I uh, stand ready to support this in any way to assure that the project succeeds and allows for the preservation of Providence Academy. And we thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you. And next we have Linda Glover. Thank you, Susan. And hello, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Linda Glover. I'm the executive director of Divine Consign. Our nonprofit chose to become a merchant in downtown Vancouver in 2005, and we immediately got involved with Vancouver's Downtown Association. We wanted to be a partner in building a vibrant urban city center. Over the years, the request has often come to us, why don't you work toward making Main Street more like Hawthorne or Alberta streets? When we get those questions, we explain that those business districts are surrounded by blocks and blocks of residential homes and apartments, and people are able to access those areas by walking, riding bikes, or driving short distances. Downtown Vancouver is bordered by the highway, the railroad tracks, and the river, not close convenient access. To grow, we needed to be and needed to have more residents and employees who can activate the street 18 hours a day. For that to happen, development has to be vertical, which is expensive. Fortunately, it is now happening. One of those developments is the Aegis development. It will provide an increase in the mix of residents. It will create jobs, which in turn provides businesses like ours more opportunity to be successful. Another important opportunity this development pro provides is to become an active node and connector from the Ford and Officers Row to downtown. It will take a step in healing the scar caused by I-5 and will work to reconnect our downtown areas. There are many more reasons I believe that this is a good project for downtown, for downtown, but others have and will cite those reasons. Having sat through many of these hearings, I know brevity and non-repetitive comments are appreciated. I encourage the <laughs> commission to please approve this project. Thank you. Okay, that was the last person on the list. Thank you for marshalling all those through so well, Susan. You did a great job. Thanks. Um, Keith, did you have any further comments? Uh, the, the only thing I'll say is I'll just uh, take into consideration the comments in regards to the trees. I'll work with the applicant to identify where those trees are again. In particular, the code does say 30, 30 foot tall trees. So we'll, we'll look closely at that. And if nothing else, definitely make sure that we make appropriate findings um, and, and how that would be mitigated in, as far as the planting. And then I'd also offer up the urban forester is also a good um, resource for, for tree planting. So we can also uh, discuss that with him as well. So that, that's all I have. Thanks very much. At this point, colleagues, the commission will now deliberate. And following deliberation, I'll accept a motion for a recommendation to the city of Vancouver. 
And so uh, please say your name when making a motion or a second so the uh, staff can record it. And we'll um, follow our tradition of uh, crafting uh, a recommendation as we go and uh, accept input from uh, all the members of the commission. And so I would uh, open it up to my colleagues for, uh, for some thoughts from which we can form this recommendation. Andy, I apologize. Remind me, this is just an okay. advisory meeting. So what is it that we would be recommending? Uh, I think at this time it would be um, appropriate and um, Susan, please uh, let me know and other staff if this is incorrect that uh, we would want to have um, the applicant and the city in possession of uh, recommendations for on behalf of the commission. And so this would be the commission's opportunity to provide uh, formal uh, input to the, uh, the process that's under consideration. And so we've, uh, in the course of the meeting, many of the questions have represented what amount to uh, concerns or um, ideas for recommendation. And so what I would like to do is solicit that input from colleagues so that we may say the uh, Historic Preservation Commission recommends, and then there would be some items. And another option would be to revisit this question at the March meeting so that we could make an informed decision or have uh, an opportunity to reflect on how we want this, uh, this recommendation to look in writing and, uh, collect, uh, and collect input from colleagues and then we could uh, hammer it into a, uh, a formal recommendation to be adopted at the March meeting. Susan, would you say that's about right? Uh, I may have Jackie jump in here. Uh, yes, I think um, uh, the recommendation part is correct. I am a little concerned about the timing um, because I, okay. think, I think it needs to happen this evening. But All right. uh, city staff or Jackie, please jump in. This is Keith Jones. Um, so we we do we do we are obligated to make a decision on this, and uh, the the timing of that would be the, the end of this month is is uh, what we're we're looking at rendering our decision. So we would we would like uh, we would like the commission to make a motion this evening, if if possible. And again, th this is a staff decision. I mean, we certainly uh, want to consider and have listened to the comments tonight, and we'll certainly consider any any motion that commission makes in rendering that uh written decision um so that's that's where we're, we're at with uh from the city staff perspective if we could uh, just kind of get a motion to staff whether the commission does support the project and if there's anything in particular that you want us to look at or for the applicant to consider that would be most most helpful thank you so Keith, if we were to provide um, bullet points, for instance, if uh, commissioners would provide input that would represent a bullet point for consideration, that uh, that recommendation would be um, approved with the proviso that staff look at the uh, uh, look at the input from the commission. C correct. That that can be, or it could be. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be in writing, chair. I mean, you we we could you could just do the motion tonight, and then I, I think this is all recorded and on the record, so we would we would have that information, and then um, I could uh, reference that in the decision uh, if you'd like me to do that. If 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 you would like to provide uh, a written response, that's fine as well. I think that's the code doesn't require uh, anything in writing. Uh, just that we have this consultation. So, however, you want to convey that to us and, and what you would like us to consider, e either way is fine with us. Okay, thank you, Keith. Sure. So, colleagues, um, if there's a motion, we could accept that. And the motion could contain uh, information uh, from the viewpoint of commissioners. 
before we get to the motion, let's should we go ahead and discuss? Okay. Briefly, I, I know for me the the trees, but that was mentioned already. Um, the questions regarding the trees and the the code that says that we should um, make every attempt not to remove them if they're over certain thirty feet, and so that's one concern. The massing is also another concern, um, although I it sounds like. There's nothing really to be done about that. So some of my concerns, it's they're just concerns. They're not things that I think can action can be taken on. So I the only one I know that we've discussed that they have also that um I think it was Keith and also the applicant said they would take a look at already are the trees. So I don't know if there are others from other commissioners that they feel that they can really make an impact with the motion. Go ahead, Jan. Oh, I would just say that the, uh, in addition to the trees, because I think a lot of the concerns that were expressed tonight, as, as Julie just noted, that the, the ship has sailed on those concerns. It's really too late to address them at this stage of the project. But I, I think the one other issue we talked about is how in the view corridor, you know, the, the most important thing is the view of the academy, and that should be the prominent role. So whatever art and landscaping go into that corridor, which again, that's great to have art and landscaping. It really needs should focus the the pedestrians and the drive by traffic on the academy rather than a mirrored entrance to the to the site. So just urge the you know that when they're selecting the art and the landscaping that they they consider that the view of the academy is the most important part. Further Dan, that's what I'm, calling, please. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I didn't catch that. Oh, I was going to say what uh, I was going to mirror what Jan said that, you know, we're really reviewing them based on this overlay code and, and the trees and the, and the, and the view corridors are really um, sticking points with the code. Um, and really emphasizing, you know, keeping the academy the focus and preserving as many trees as possible because I have noticed in downtown Vancouver a ton of trees coming down for all of these big buildings projects that are going on and then they plant these little baby trees and uh, I, it's been really I've been really upset by it uh, in downtown Vancouver um, so I would hope that we could save as many trees as possible. Would there uh, be a sense that we could uh, move to uh, recommend, provided that the uh, staff take the considerations, concerns, and questions that commissioners raised during the course of the hearing be included? Or th that uh, the concerns, questions, and commentary that uh, commissioners provided um, be taken into consideration as the city moves forward. I think that's an appropriate recommendation, so I'll make that motion. Okay, so it's been, I'll try to restate it, Jan. So it's been moved that the <laughs> Historic Preservation Commission uh, approves the proposal with the proviso that staff take the comments, questions, and concerns voiced by individual commissioners and as a collective body into consideration during the course of future deliberations or the decision uh, future decision. Yeah, the future decisions. Just a question on, on or a comment on that. Um, I agree completely all the all the comments from the commissioners should be you know given to staff for consideration. Um, but the applicant and staff, I think, were also asking us specifically to look at options one, two, and three in terms of the treatment of that view corridor or the access corridor. And if we had any specific feeling about any one of those options, um, maybe we could include that as part of our motion as well. I 
I so agree. Great and and amendment. Amendment. I agree with you. Um, great. And it sounded to me just my interpretation of our discussion and comments was that nobody seemed too excited about option three. Uh, and and I, I didn't get a, a, a really sense of a, a lot of enthusiasm for option two. Um, so and, and option one, I think we were concerned that the way it was depicted made it look, you know, like we we're going to have a lot of long poles there when I, I think we would like to see maybe something a little more low key that wouldn't interfere with the, the views of the academy, but would still provide yeah. some, you know, in additional educational opportunities, directional opportunities, and, you know, just creating a, a more of an inviting entry into into the project. So, it sounds like we're more leaning toward maybe a, a, a lower key version of option one, but we may not have all of the details in front of us at this point to to completely, you know, sign off on that. So maybe we can, as part of our motion, if the commission agrees, say we're more interested in the type of the general thrust of option one, but, you know, subject to you know, addressing some of the concerns that we had and seeing some more of the details. Can I you like to, uh, Greg, would it uh, be uh, possible if we uh, had the opportunity to revisit those options or possibly uh, review uh, additional options? You know, again, we are advisory on this and the decision is going to be made by the end of the month. So if, if Aaron is willing to provide us contact information so that if we had suggestions, we can relay those to his team. But I, I don't think asking them to come back with a, a revision of the arc that, that they're going to propose for the entryways is probably going to be appropriate. So I, I, like well, Greg's suggestion that, I like Greg's suggestion that we're, it looked like the commission was leaning towards option one with maybe, uh, you know, less focus on really tall, um, structures so that again the focus is on the academy can i also just make a comment i do think it's a little subjective though too because i actually i like option two on the left i do like the op the idea of thresholds and entering new spaces through thresholds and archways kind of provide that transition between a noisy urban environment and transition into a more lush peaceful natural landscape and so i do like the concept of option two doesn't necessarily mean they need to reflect this exactly so i do think there's some discussion to be had if that's the intent is to is to get us to narrow down which option um but I, if that's not necessarily the intent and they're they're like one or two sounds good then i suppose we could do that but i i personally prefer option two. <laughs> so I don't know if we would be able to really kind of make that advisory recommendation, whatever you want to call it. And then um, if I could just add one thing, um, it just, it, it really specifies that these are supposed to be zero height. These, these entryways, like they're supposed to be open. I, I too like the idea of thresholds and I really liked that idea. And, and I like that idea in parks a lot of times in parks or in cemeteries when you're transitioning through space. But we're also trying to create this urban fabric, right? That we're all just kind of talking, or, you know, at least a lot of the supporters of the project are talking about this urban fabric and walking around, you know, I walk around downtown all the time. I walk all the way up from 25th, all the way down to the waterfront and back. Um, so, so I just really want to emphasize uh, with those options that they really, you know, look at the code and really try to, minimize the height of whatever it is that they decide in that in that entryway so that when you're looking through it you're not looking through a, a portal to see the uh academy you're walking down the street and you look to the left and you, you catch it out of the corner of your eye and then next thing you know you're going left and you're going down that corridor you know so I, I, I have confidence in the art team and I have confidence in, in the planning of the people who are doing the work. And I really think they're open. I think Aaron's 
open. And I think he said that his, his project manager, Annie, is really open to uh, more, having more discussions about um, the art. And like Jan said, you know, having that kind of contact information so that we can share that. Uh, Chair, this is Aaron. If I can um, just interject for a second. Um, this feedback is, is helpful. Um, the design of that pedestrian corridor is not going to get done in the next 30 days. I mean, when Keith is talking about that timeline, he's talking about land use approval. Um, so if this commission is interested, which it sounds like you are, we're happy to bring back um, the all of the art that is produced through the creative process for your input. And we're, we're going to take it to the, the Public Arts Committee as well. So um, we're happy to, to bring it to you during the design process to get feedback. Um, so if that's if that's helpful and you're interested, we're happy to do that formally or informally, however, however you see fit. Uh, with that in mind, I uh, crafted a, a, a motion and maybe somebody will make it. Jan's made it, but let me know if this is uh, in keeping with uh, your, your thoughts. Historic Preservation Commission recommends approval of the uh, Aegis mixed use development phase two with the proviso that staff and applicant consider commissioners questions, concerns, and comments expressed in the course of the advisory review. That's perfect. Is there a second? I will second that motion. Thanks, Morgan. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that Historic Preservation Commission recommends approval of the Aegis Multi-Use Development Phase 2 with the proviso that staff and applicants consider commissioners' questions, concerns, and comments expressed in the course of the advisory review. So, with that in mind, Susan, maybe you'll take roll call to approve the motion. Absolutely. Paige Alfuth. Aye. Jan Bader. Aye. Julie Bond. Aye. Morgan Frazier. Aye. Greg Foos. Aye. Andy Gregg. Aye. Six yes and zero no. The motion has passed. Thank you everyone for your careful consideration of this important topic. Moving on now to old business and updates. City's upcoming strategic plan. I think Jason is going to speak about this item. Jason, please. sorting that out this is jan due to my technical difficulties tonight i've had to do this on my cell phone and i am about to my battery is about to die here so um i'm gonna hang in as long as possible but don't be surprised if i i cut out all of a sudden because i'm i'm down to like four percent thank you for the uh for the heads up jason are you there i am here can you hear me we can Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. I, I put headphones in and for some reason now it's working. My apologies. Okay. Um, no, no, so yeah, um, I just want to confirm that you did in fact get the um, letter forwarded to you from, I believe, either Susan or Jackie in regards to participating in the upcoming strategic plan commission. That should have been sent to you on uh, January 20th. 
the deadline has closed on January 25th. Um, so I don't know if that, I apologize if that came too late in the game for some of you to take advantage of that, but I did hear back from um, city staff today that there will be opportunities to participate in a volunteer role outside of actually being part of the commission. So I just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. And if you had any questions or, or needed a point of contact, I would be that for you. Thank you very much. And there's to be a comment on rules and policies. Hi there, this is Bart. Can you hear and see me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I know it's been a, a long evening so far, so I won't take too much of your time. Um, this is a uh, topic somewhat near and dear to the commission's heart. So. Um, Jackie and Susan and I wanted to, to bring it to everyone's attention. Um, as you are all probably more aware than me, because you've been on the commission and I'm the newer employee here, the uh, staff started uh, working on the uh, HPC rules and procedures uh, update for uh, the rules and procedures that uh, uh, both the program itself and, and specifically uh, the commission uses uh, outside of the county code itself. Um, and last summer, uh, a previous employee did a presentation at the August meeting. Um, I've reviewed that meeting. Uh, Susan has uh, reviewed that as well. And um, so we see the, the decisions and comments that were made about how um, uh, the commission wanted to approach um, amending and and revising the rules and procedure rules and procedures at that time. Um, so, bring, coming up to the present, uh, that that project kind of got put on hold because of staffing and COVID and the holidays. But here we are in the new year with capacity, and we've got it on our uh, our uh, workload to to work on the project. And so the point of, of bringing it up at this point in the meeting is not to get into any specifics about it, but simply to bring it back to the commission's attention and let you know that um, we are currently working on it in the background and ready to begin bringing um, sections of the rules and procedures to the commission for consideration. Um, under the plan that was formulated last year, uh, which basically was uh, kind of a divide and conquer plan, so to speak. Um, that's what Susan and I took away from it, that you would um, prefer to look at the rules and procedures as a group together, rather than creating a um, subcommittee or work group, although you still have that option if that's what you'd like to do. and. Um, if you want to look at them all together, then we could bring them in manageable bite sized chunks, so to speak. Um, at each subsequent meeting, as long as it's not a very thick meeting with lots of applications, in which case we could do a special work session or something. Um, Bart, so I think it was, uh, I think it was our decision to uh, take it in pieces with everybody present. So that yep. we didn't have a subcommittee who became masters of the universe and everybody else was unaware. And especially since uh, we, we haven't met for a while, but I would like to make it a uh, um, a chapter or an agenda item that we could go through uh, one at a time. And that's great. And we assumed that that the commission would um, want to continue along that road, um, but. That was the main purpose of bringing it up in, in uh, this section of the meeting was to make sure that there weren't any new thoughts, uh, a change of course, um, and so that we didn't hit you out of left field uh, for the agenda of the next meeting, having that be a line, line item to work on. Because it, it will, as you guys know, take, take some time, even if staff does most of the heavy lifting in the background, it's still, going to take a fair amount of your time to, to work through it and, and make your comments. Thank you. 
So, um, Bart, we um, be providing yes. we be we be providing information before our meeting so that we can kind of read and kind of be up to speed on whatever rule or like bite sized chunk we're looking we're we're looking at. Absolutely, I I would um, we would basically preemptively give everyone information about what we plan to work on and make sure that everyone was okay with not only the subject matter, but, but the order and the timing. And, and so that um, then we could just use it the same way that you would get a regular agenda item. You would have time to review it, come up with notes and comments so that um, by the time we got to the meeting, it would be a productive and relatively efficient process. And one thing that I would like to add, having had time to go back and look through all the work that was done by staff over the last few years in stops and starts on this project, is that an awful lot of good work has been done already. So Susan and I have no intent of reinventing the wheel if it's not necessary. Um, <laughs> people that are on this call tonight have made great comments. And, and so, um, we would like to just pick up where we left off with some fresh eyes and push this over the finish line this year, as, as long as the commission's okay with that. Thanks very much. Okay. Any other thoughts from any of the other commissioners on this one? Okay, great. Thanks, Barth. Rules and policies? Uh, I think that's what we just talked about. Oh, was it? My, oh, I'm sorry. Um, now we have committee reports, uh, the underrepresented populations. Um, in the course of um, talking with uh, April Busby at the museum, I had a discussion with her about uh, bringing underrepresented uh, communities more into the spotlight. And my effort had been to um, use National History Day with the schools as uh, a vehicle. But that's been uh, frustrating and has been frustrated because National History Day will be taking place virtually this year. And part of the dynamic, um, part of the dynamic impact that uh, National History Day can make is that it's in person with exhibits and papers and presentations. And so, um, I, my report is brief. It's that uh, it, it's been an up and it's been an uphill climb on that. And Susan, how about the uh, overlay, uh, the the heritage overlay district work? Um, you, can, okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry to talk over you. There's some delay here. Uh, I can speak to That's that. Okay. Um, uh, very briefly, um, so our last meeting was uh, in late uh, November, and um, after uh, we, we had some, some action items that we uh, have made progress on, uh, including continued outreach to um, stakeholders, including um, with Brad at the uh, museum, and he has facilitated uh, a digital handshake with me and um, with <laughs> Joe Squires as as we discussed, um, and so we're we're ready to um, bring Joe to to speak uh, with with the committee uh, whenever it's uh, when we can figure out a good meeting time. And um, I have uh, individually conferred with uh, the the committee members and so no one else has had any individual contacts uh, with with the city. So the next step would be to, to move forward and, and start uh, that true outreach with uh, with city staff and, and see where that that takes us. And I would be um, more than happy to arrange another um, me uh, meeting of the committee if the committee wishes to do so in, in the next month or whenever it's appropriate. Thanks very much. We have now come to good of the order in which uh, 
we have an opportunity to express our thanks to colleagues. And I would like to uh, express my thanks to staff and commissioners uh, for their excellent work at tonight's meeting. It was, uh, was, was really great. I just want to say that. Thank you very much. Any other good of the order? I just Hearing want to none. Thank you to oh. Julie. <laughs> Sorry? I wanted to say thank you to Julie for bringing up that brief, uh, 27. I sent that to Susan. Oh, so right. That she can this. Uh, I really, I had forgotten I think, about that brief. And when you said it, I was like, oh, I know what she's talking about. So thank you for being my memory jog. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And to thank everyone for their excellent scholarship and preparation for tonight's meeting. It was, uh, it was really heartening. Thank you so much. At this time, I would accept a motion to adjourn. I'll, second. I'll make that motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. Thank you. Julie, would you like to make that a second? Yes, I make that a second. <laughs> There will be no dis there will be no discussion on this item. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that the meeting be adjourned. All in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks everybody, and I'll see you next month. Thank you, staff. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Good night. Good night, Paige. Good night, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. No problem. I'll get the minutes ready for you guys ASAP. Oh, thanks. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Thank you.